Good evening and welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting for February 7, 2013. Um, before I open up for public comment section, there was a statement that I was going to read relative to an assault that occurred down on Strong Avenue um, and in the context being a discussion about hate crimes and we'll find out more about that, but we're actually bringing that into the body of the meeting because uh, it was the desire of the council to vote it as a resolution to add extra emphasis to the point that we're trying to make and illustrate. So, um, and we'll bring that up early in the agenda so people who are interested in that will not have to sit here for a long time and watch us do the good work of the city that we do. Um, we're, at this point, we're opening up the meeting to public comment. Um, the rules for public comment are you may speak on any issue. Uh, we ask that you respect decorum and respect individuals and that you speak to the issue. And if you do speak, if you hear somebody say the same thing that you were going to say, please reconsider standing up and repeating that. Uh, there's a three minute limit, uh, a timer that you'll see there and a little gong goes off if you go over the three minutes. We don't taser you if you if you go over the three minutes, but we ask that you please, at that tone, consider winding up. It has happened on occasion where some people felt that what they had to say was so urgent that they spoke much longer after that in violation of the request to stop. If that should happen, we'll actually uh, call recess, the cameras will go off, and then the person will be asked to uh, vacate the chambers and will uh, revoke the poss any possible opportunity to speak before this council again. I know that sounds stern, but I'm sorry. That it's, it's rare, but we have to cover all bases. So we'll start with Susan Lance. And, and, I, and when you come up, please identify yourself and where you live. Hi, I'm Susan Lance, and I'm from um, 74 Lyman Road in Northampton. And thank you for being here, as you always are, every two weeks, and for allowing uh, for the public comment. I'm here to tell you about a really exciting proposition that's coming up, and it's called Solarize Northampton, we hope. Uh, Northampton is applying to be part of the Solarize Mass program. This is about the third year the state has offered it. And basically, in a nutshell, what it does is, besides all the other good rebates and the tax credits and all of that that are in place for solar now, it adds another layer, depending on the number of people or the number of kilowatt hours, I should say, that we get people in Northampton to either buy outright for uh, in solar panels or lease them so it doesn't involve upfront money. It uh, goes in different tiers. So let's say tier one is 1,000 kilowatt hours and tier five is 5,000 kilowatt hours. In between the cost, there'll be a 20% reduction of whatever the price is. So I am, um, it's a three tier process here. Our energy uh, commissioner, Chris Mason, is kind of you know overseeing all this from the city. I represent uh, the volunteer community part uh, of the solar coach team. And then there will be the installer that has yet to be selected as to who the actual solar installer will be. Why I'm here, we haven't gotten this designation yet. It's open to every town and every city in the state. It's a good deal. They're going to, there's going to be a lot of competition applying for this. I'm especially here because I would love it if you would make sure I know how to contact your neighborhood organization. I, I'm here to make sure that you send out through your email list, your constituent list, the survey that we're trying to get to all everyone we can in Northampton. This will be represented, the neighborhood uh, associations will be highly represented in our application because you are the tentacles, you know, you, you invade the community more than any other structure that we have. 
So it is really critical that we try to reach out to them. I put a piece of paper on your uh, desk. It tells briefly what the program is. It gives you the survey monkey thing. I will email it to you all again, and you will know what it's about. And as I say, really what I'm asking for you to do is send out the survey on your email list and to make sure I know how to contact your neighborhood association because we really would like letters of support from the neighborhood associations because that shows we have good broad representation thank you thank you sir. uh mcgrath is next you're right <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ruth McGrath. I live at 52 Longview Drive in Florence. I'm here on behalf of the Northampton Committee on Disabilities. The Committee on Disabilities had our January meeting, reviewed a proposed ordinance, which is number four on your agenda tonight, regarding the request for a handicapped parking space near the inter intersection of Henshaw Avenue and Crescent Street. Also, Patricia Shaughnessy, uh, Northampton ADA co Coordinator and Committee on Disabilities Liaison, reported on her site visit of the area for the handicapped parking space and recommended the installation of the handicapped parking space. After discussion by the committee on the request for addition of this handicapped parking space, the Committee on Disabilities unanimously voted to approve and recommend that a handicapped parking space be placed near the intersection of Henshaw Avenue and Crescent Street. The Committee on Disabilities has reviewed the proposed ordinance and recommends its approval by the City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Joe Tassoni. Hi, uh, my name's Joe Tassoni. I'm a physician in Northampton. I've been practicing here about uh, nine or 10 years, and I'm one of the owners of the 10 Main Street office building. And um, I'd like to ask the town council to avoid voting in any restrictions on parking on Middle Street. Um, over the course of the last nine to ten years, Florence has become a real bustling competitive business district. And a big part of that bustling competitive business district has been the professional offices, <coughs> medical, legal, dental, orthodontics. Florence has become a center in Northampton and all of Hampshire County for medical professional services. In fact, it is the only place in all of Hampshire County where someone can get cardiology care, gastroenterology care, or urology care. Over the course of the last 10 years, the Silk Mill has become a professional office building. 10 Main Street has been changed from a Dusalt trucking uh, building to an, a busy office building. The Brick Mill has changed from a dilapidated, falling down building to a busy professional office building. And Valley Medical Group has one of their hub offices in downtown Florence. This brings an incredible amount of business to the, to the downtown area. Um, and it's the type of business that neighborhoods should like to have nearby. We don't park on their streets at night. We don't park on their streets during the weekends. We don't, in general, make noise. We're approachable if there's a problem with the parking. Um, and for the benefit of the patients that come from Hampshire County, Franklin County, and Hamden County, this is the only place where they can get urology care, cardiology care, and, uh, ura and um, GI care. And many of these people are old, infirmed, handicapped, have difficulty walking long distances. And if my staff is forced to park in our parking lot, then these patients have to park off site and walk great distances to get to the office building. So what I would like is for there to be no restricted parking on Middle Street or any of the streets in the area. And in an effort to try to make this work for everyone, our office, at our own cost, has assigned a parking liaison to take care of parking issues that we have with our neighbors. We do not want unhappy neighbors. We want to make everybody happy. We want to be good neighbors, and we are good neighbors. We turn off our parking lots at night so that the lights don't shine on people's TVs. You know, we have a parking liaison that will go out and talk to anybody that is giving one of the neighbors problems by parking too close to their driveway or, or any particular problem. If someone's making noise early in the morning, all the neighbor has to do is tell us, we will approach that employee and make that problem stop. 
Um, so with that in mind, for the benefit of all the patients of both Northampton and uh, Hampshire, Hamden, and Franklin County, I would ask that you don't allow any restricted parking on Middle Street. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Frank Myers. Frank Myers, uh, 10 Main Street. I also work in the building that Joe went through, and I'm not going to go through uh, everything that he just went through. Uh, I'm really most concerned about the patients, okay? That's my only concern at this point. It's a question of, of them parking really close by and being able to get in. And most of our patients are elderly, ill. And if we park there, they do have to go walking down the streets uh, that are uh, cracks in the roads and ice storms. Uh, and it just seems to me almost humane to try to get them as close as possible so that they can get in in a safe manner. And as Joe said, I mean, we are uh, trying to be really, really good neighbors and also to help with the benefit of the growth of Florence. So I very much would uh, appreciate uh, us keeping the, uh, the, res the restrictions uh, away from Middle Street to allow uh, Florence to uh, flourish. I'll make it short. Thank you, Frank. Uh, David Beckman. David Berkman, I'm also uh, one of the physicians that works in that building. And I'll also try not to repeat the points made. You know, I, we've come to many, many meetings, uh, the Ordinance Committee, it, it seemed, this issue seems to just have come around and around and around each time, seemed to have been settled. Um, you know, and it seemed that some very simple suggestions had been made, which really made a big difference. So the idea of just parking lines so that the cars wouldn't all get crammed in, so that only two cars would be in between the parking, in between the uh, driveways instead of three. Somehow, I don't think that those very reasonable and very simple measures have been done and, and, and really should be. I don't think it's really as big a problem as has been made out to be. Uh, and I, I just would encourage you not to put restrictions on the, on the streets there in, a, in an area that's just a, a, a growing and vibrant business area. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I got your name. Uh, Jeff Cooley. Hello, my name is Jeff Cooley. I'm a physician and uh, work at 10 Main Street. Um, I'm also talking about the Middle Street parking. Uh, working in Boston for 20 years, there were neighborhoods in Cambridge where people had parking permits and only people who lived there were allowed to park there. And I think that would be a great idea. In other words, wouldn't that be wonderful if you were the only one who could park there? In many of those places, they didn't have garages, and, and people would have parking permits, and no one else could park there. But this is Northampton and Florence, and it's just not, frankly, not what we have. We don't have private parking permits so that only neighbors can park in the neighborhood. And we got 190 signatures when we surveyed uh, area residents about whether or not they felt there should be restrictions on the parking in Middle Street. And they strongly felt uh, that there should be no restrictions on the parking in Middle Street. Um, I think it's unrealistic to think that you'd close off a street um, to people to park. Um, I just don't think that's within the character of Florence or Northampton. And I think we worry about our patients and I'm hoping that the committee will uh, recognize the importance of, uh, of looking after uh, our patients like, like we try to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tori Eklund. I'm Tori Eklund, and I serve as the chair of the Northampton Committee on Disabilities. At our Committee on Disabilities meeting in January, a draft of the proposed ordinance revision to Section 22, 2297 through 2299, the Committee on Disabilities Changing to Disability Com Commission, was reviewed. The proposed changes will bring the city in alignment with state law regarding disabilities commissions. The Committee on Disabilities will again be reviewing and discussing the changes to the city's current ordinance and the proposed changes at our February meeting so that we, in the end, are in compliance with state law. Thank you, Tori. <clears throat> Jeff Harness. 
Hi, Jeff Florence. I live at Overlook Drive in Florence. Also here about the 10 Main Street parking issue. And I'm representing Curly Dickinson in the interest of our patients. And uh, here to, um, I guess, reiterate some of the points that were made earlier, but to uh, just confirm our agreement with that, that we're concerned that patients have access to care, and obviously parking is an, an important part of that ac access. Uh, we know that that area of Florence has been rehabbed by that building. I remember when I first moved to Florence, that area of the building was kind of abandoned, weeds, some trash, and it's beautiful now. And uh, the transformation has been um, really profound. I used to work in that building in the late 90s, early 2000s, and I can tell you that workers and patients buy lunch, we support businesses. So I think the, um, the ability of that area to continue to support this building and figure out a way to cooperate on parking is really vital to support the business community and to keep the, uh, the flow of people and action um, going. Um, so I guess in, in closing, I'll just reiterate that I'm in support of maintaining parking on Middle Street with no additional restrictions. Thank Thanks. Uh, Suzanne Seymour. Hello, I'm Susan Seymour. I live at uh, 431 Spring Street in Florence. I am the executive director of the LGBT Coalition of Western Massachusetts. Uh, the LGBT Coalition is committed to promoting the rights and safety of LGBT individuals. A few days ago, what appears to be a random act of violence was committed against a gay man in Northampton. We were contacted by the victim's brother who was concerned that this matter wouldn't get the attention it deserved. We then contacted Mayor Narkowitz and Councilman Dwight who have drafted a statement which to my understanding will be read later this evening. I'd like to publicly thank the Mayor the Northampton Police Department and Councilman Dwight for their strong stance against vi violence and letting it be known that these acts will not be tolerated. We cannot afford to become complacent in the face of violence and on behalf of the coalition, I thank you in advance for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nora Kalina. Good evening, I'm Nora Kalina. I live at 8 Middle Street in Florence and I'm here about the Middle Street parking issue. Um, I do want to share that I don't think anybody's denying that 10 Main Street is a beautiful building and that the parking lot is beautifully maintained and that it adds to the vibrance of Florence. But Florence has a really delicate balance between businesses and between residents. And right now, the parking on Middle Street is really affecting our quality of life. I also really don't understand why there's not enough parking in their parking lot and why the zoning is really not appropriate for that building. To overflow into the neighborhoods is really leaning on the goodwill of the neighbors. Um, the street's really narrow, and I understand streets are narrow, and I understand people want to park on streets, but it makes it really difficult for me to pull out in the morning, and it makes the street really difficult to pass by when it's snowing. Um, we had a snowstorm a couple of weeks ago and somebody decided to leave their car on the street so the street didn't get plowed properly for instance. I know that there's been talk about putting lines on the street and perhaps that would help ease things a little bit but still the street's going to be crowded and our street becomes business parking and I really really don't think that's fair. I mean how is Florence going to develop properly if we don't have proper parking? Who's to say that Florence Savings Bank wouldn't sell their parking lot and develop it? because somebody else is using residential parking as their business parking. I really don't think it's fair. I really don't think it's appropriate. We've heard some talk about a parking liaison. I personally know about the parking liaison because I've been here at these <coughs> meetings. The parking liaison really hasn't made herself known to the rest of the community. Dr. Tassoni has kindly offered to put out cones when there's events on the street, and I think that's wonderful, but most people don't know about that. So we talk about being good neighbors, but there's really not really great communication. So I really urge you guys to please uh, consider putting the two-hour parking back in effect. Um, it made a great deal of difference to our quality of life um, on Middle Street, and it really quieted things down. I don't want patients stumbling. I don't want anybody stumbling and, and have anybody's safety affected. But I really do think that business should, should be um, responsible um, and really provide the parking that needs to be provided and not direct people to our street because I really don't think residential streets should be used as business parking. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pat Tibbetts.
My name is Patty Tibbetts, and I live at 21 Middle Street in Florence. I've been there for 37 years, um, almost as long as a few other people on the street. Um, I'm not going to go over all the things I had listed because most of these things have been covered by other people. I will say that um, this issue has been smoldering, smoking, burning, and smoldering again for uh, three, this is the third year. Um, it's not a good situation. It's the kind of issue that, um, that I, call, I call the safety issue. Um, what's happening is that Middle Street has become an extension of a business. We're, we're not a residential street anymore. We're, we're the extension of the businesses uh, that, that do serve our community but do not serve us. Um, I, I happen to, I'm a retired person, I'm a retired school teacher. Um, after having taught 35 years, I, I found other interests, but a lot of them uh, center in my office, which is right on Middle Street. And I mean, I look right out the window and see Middle Street. I see very few patients hobbling out of their cars and going down the icy street to get to either of the professional buildings. I see four or five doctors, and I see um, staff, and it's the same doctors and the same staff. So, so to say that our street and the people on our street are horrible people because we're not letting others uh, that need to get medical assistance get it is absolutely not true. Um, in the petition that we sent, uh, sent on to you, um, people from Middle Street and Pine Street and thereabouts signed that petition. Uh, we didn't have access to residents of Northampton who came in as patients and, and were kind of subjected to, well, geez, do you want to park here or do you want to have to park someplace way away? Well, of course those patients are going to say, we don't want to park far away. Cheekers. Um, it, it's just not fair to say that either. And that petition that the doctors came up with was not fair either. It wasn't fair to their very own patients to force them, force them really, to sign that petition. You know, they didn't put their hands to the paper, but they certainly said to them, well, gee, you know, don't you want to be at a park on Middle Street? And I'm here to tell you, those patients are not parking on Middle Street. It's doctors and staff. And it's the same 10 to 12 cars every single day. And it really, really needs to, needs to have something happen with it. My time's almost up, but I'd really, I'd like the businesses to come to the plate. I'd like them to take their own responsibility for the business. I'd like them to come forward and to, and to actually pay for the spaces they need, to shuttle people in if they need to. They're a business, they can afford it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the last name on the sign-up sheet. Is anyone interested in speaking? Well, as we spoke. Uh, you, sir, first. And please state your name and your address. <clears throat> Jim Spencer, 12 Middle Street. I've uh, been there since 1947. So I've known Middle Street for a long time. It is an issue. Yes, we have a parking problem. No one's going to be happy with the results. The results need to be more sharing, a little bit more common sense. You know, let's not park four cars where you can only park three. Um, I've talked to you guys, the doctors, I say good morning every day. Some of you guys are pretty good. Some of you guys are a little pushing the envelope. And when I call the lady, I've called her half a dozen times. She responds, but not like when we need her. You know, she does come down. Karen, Karen is good about that. But it's a bigger picture. And what's going to happen, I'm afraid, is if you people say no to the two-hour parking, we, the residents, will just park there early in the morning and leave our cars there all day. So it's, we don't want to see that either. I don't want to see pushing and shoving and people yelling at each other and blowing smoke in their faces and all kinds of things. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamite situation that may turn bad. And I just want you to be aware of what may come up in this statement. Thank, thank you. Uh, does someone else like to speak? Kitty? I got you. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Kitty Calligan, and I'm um, 
here on behalf of the Northampton Living Wage Coalition, and I want to thank the, the, the City Council for tonight announcing the, um, the new living wage rate for 2013. Um, this is important because um, this benefits low-wage workers who do important and hard work <clears throat> taking care of um, children, the elderly, disabled, um, they are cashiers, they are janitors, and a number of, a number of other jobs here in Northampton that really make this city work. Um, since the passage of the living wage resolution at the end of 2009, um, the rate has gone from $11.90 an hour to, tw this, this year it will go to $12.78 an hour. This is in contrast to the minimum wage, which has been 2008, since 2008, it has been $8 an hour, so it has not budged for five years. So as a result, we have hardworking workers in Northampton who, who are not able to make ends meet. Um, they can't afford to pay, at times, pay their rent, to pay their utilities. There are low-wage workers who are not able to, to have their heat go above 60 degrees in the winter. So I'm very grateful that last year we had 33 employers who certified as paying at least a living wage and two employers who certified as paying, um, who as aspiring to pay a living wage. And I'm, hope, I'm, I'm hoping that this coming year that additional employers will step up to the plate and get certified <coughs> under either of those two categories so that more living wage workers will be able to make ends meet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, sir. You're right. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Bott. I live at 32 Pine Street, and I own a house on 33 Middle Street. Um, you know, there's been a lot of change in Florence over the years, and I remember when that was do so trucking too. Um, but it's a residential neighborhood. We're dealing with excessive speeding on Pine Street and lots of traffic. And then you got the parking. Um, Middle Street is a very narrow street. It's barely passable in two directions with cars parked continuously down the street. You know, if, if you drew lines and you put one spot in between each house, then people would be able to pull over and move down, but I don't think that would solve their problem. It's very difficult if you're on the other side of the street to back out of your driveway because there's cars behind you and you can't get into the street. And it's a commercial building that was allowed to expand without proper parking. They, they were given a pass by zoning. Florence Savings Bank has a huge parking lot. Valley Medical's got plenty of parking. Goggins Real Estate's got plenty of parking. All these other businesses have got plenty of parking. 10, middle, uh, 10 Main Street doesn't. They need to figure out where they're going to park their people. I understand you don't want your patients walking around the corner, um, but that doesn't mean you should park in, in the residential neighborhood. Um, you know, one or two people now and then, that's one thing. But, you know, the guy in the paper this morning referred to Middle Street as a commercial neighborhood. It's not a commercial neighborhood. It's one and two family houses the entire length of the street. And it's a narrow street. You know, it's not, it's not where 10 Main Street should be planning on parking their employees. They need to figure out another way to do it, just like all the other businesses have. And, um, you, know, you know, they rent some spaces from the church at the end of the street. Half of those spaces go unoccupied, and part of that's because people don't want to walk that far to their office. You've got to get over that. You got a carpool, you, you, know, you got to figure it out. And um, it shouldn't be dumped on the residents of Middle Street to, um, to pick up for the parking um, that they weren't fortunate enough to have on their site. Goggins' lot is half empty all, all the time, it's right next door. There's lots of other places to park in the neighborhood. They got to do this instead of just putting up signs saying there's parking on Middle Street. That's what I feel about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like? Yes, ma'am. My name's Ann Wassell, and I live at 32 Pine Street in Florence. 
and I'm also speaking to the issue of the parking on Middle Street. Um, it's also a parking uh, issue of parking on Pine Street because we also get the overflow of parking in front of our houses. Um, people have spoken very well about what the issue is for us. Um, and again, as one of the other women spoke about, it's not patients that we're seeing. We're seeing staff that's parking over and over again. Same cars, same staff people every day. So they're there eight and 10 hours a day. So it's not like if there's a patient there and it's turning over every hour or two. This is long time parking that these people are there. And I also feel like it is unfair to pit the employees and the neighborhood against each other when the owners of that building really need to take responsibility for their parking. Um, I've worked at Bay State Medical Center for 33 years. We have had the same issue in the neighborhood down there of employees taking up valuable residential parking. Um, and Bay State came up with a solution of buying off-site parking and shuttling people there. It's an option that I think that they should be encouraged strongly to look into doing, and how much do they encourage them to do um, carpooling. But I do feel strongly that those of us that um, live on the street should not have to have the congestion of business parking there all the time. It is a precarious neighborhood because we are right on the edge of the business community, which we all support and like being close to those services, but would really like to preserve the quality of our residential um, neighborhood also. And, you know, I live in a side-by-side -side <coughs> two-family. We have parking, but as our issue is, is moving cars in and out behind each other, there are often days when we can't even move our cars around in and out of our own parking um, space because in front of our house, it's totally congested with parking from employees from the medical building. So there's no place for us to even shift our cars around in front of our own house. Um, anyway, I would like to see the owner step to the plate and take responsibility for finding parking, as has Valley Medical, as has Florence Savings Bank, as has Goggins, as have other people. Um, and if they were downtown, you know, they would have, uh, or they would have to be either having paying in parking meters or finding other parking. And we're just asking that they and the city council really help um, preserve the neighborhood and make that business step up to the plate. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Seeing no more folks, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Councilor Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Boyd. Here. Here. Present. Here. 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 Um, let's see. I'm going to beg the council's indulgence here, uh, given that we have a pretty well ended meeting for a variety of things. And what I'd like to do is, if if agree, is to move up in the agenda write off uh, a resolution that that uh, that I presented you with. So moved. Okay. Uh, all those, in, is there a second on that? Okay. All those in favor of moving that up? Aye. 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 Um, this, this is a late file, so actually, yeah. Um, Suspend rule. Sorry? Suspend rule. Suspend rule. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Uh, this is a resolution <coughs> regarding hate crime. Over the weekend, uh, a man was assaulted on Strong Avenue here in Northampton with a, a terrifying ferocity. He was struck in the face with a viciousness that no decent person can comprehend. Blows continued even after he lost consciousness. Police are investigating and there are few details available to make any determination regarding the motive for this crime. There have been concerns and speculation expressed within the community that this attack was a hate crime because the victim is a gay man who was leaving an event at a bar on Strong Avenue that was advertised as gay friendly. It is important to emphasize that no determination has been made regarding motive and the investigation of the assault is in its earliest stages and it's premature for any official to say otherwise. But that said, Regardless of the outcome of this specific episode, it's appropriate and imperative now that we assert in the most emphatic way our abhorrence for crimes motivated by bigotry. A hate crime when it occurs is an affront to the ethos of this community. It is an assault that injures the victim. But more than that, it is an assault on the members of the group that is being targeted 
and by extension, an assault on this entire community. All crimes that leave victims are considered by us to be repugnant, but in hate crimes, there's the added element of an express contempt for the virtues that we cherish, and thus amplifying the offense. Now, therefore, be resolved on behalf of the City Council, Mayor David Narkowitz, the Chief of Police, Russell Sinkowitz, his personnel, and the citizens of Northampton, the Northampton City Council emphatically declares that the City of Northampton will not abide ta uh, attacks, be they verbal, psychic, or physical, on any person because of who they are or who they are presumed to be. Anyone who commits a hate crime in Northampton must know that they have no sanctuary here. I'll accept a motion. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. President, for uh, composing this and for the work that you've been doing with the uh, with the police department and the mayor to um, to to really get clear as to where we are today uh, regarding the facts of the case. But I I really thank you also for uh, articulating our values. I just want to say simply, I can't even imagine this. This is just beyond my comprehension. This could actually happen. I just don't know what would plant that seed. So I, well, I that's I all I can say. And, and I appreciate that sentiment. I want to in, emphasize here that in this particular incident, we do not know. We are not in possession of any circumstances that would indicate that this is or is not a hate crime. It's still, so. I, the only caution that I'm extending here is because we certainly don't want to have an adverse impact on any of the process of investigation. And, but at the same time, while recognizing a grievous injury has been visited upon a person who, uh, for all uh, understanding that we know now, was attacked for no reason without provocation and brutally. But the, to the larger issue, and that's what this speaks to, is that it is appropriate at this time, given the sentiments that is aroused that we respond, that we say to everyone in this community that this is not something that we, we, we are, we're often tagged and often brag, maybe unjustifiably so, that we are a tolerant community. We will not tolerate this. So to that extent, that's where tolerance stops. Constantly. I just want to clarify, I was speaking to the beating. Right. Just the beating. Wherever it came from, we don't even know anything about yet. But the beating was horrendous. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor. Yes, um, I want to thank you, Council President, for putting this in place. I think the language in here is very, very valuable. And us as city councilors will not tolerate any form of hate crime. And I've said that as a city councilor in Ward 6 because we have had a hate crime three years ago, and I thank you for doing this. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you. Um, now, also given the fact that there's got the house filled with essentially the entire residents of Middle Street and the entire employee and staff system of 10, Middle, uh, 10 Main Street. Um, I don't know if the council wants to move that. I think that's further on the I, agenda I, I, to, to discuss. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, just for the folks playing at home, mm -hmm. we're, we're whacking the agenda like crazy right now. The, but we're also trying to pay consideration that um, these chairs are hard, and that it might be difficult to sit in, to listen to longer deliberative processes here. Okay, and this is going to require an amendment um, adjusting the time. So first, we're going to place this on the floor. Uh, anyone hear a motion to? So moved. Second. Second. Um, the uh, proposed amendment is to change the time from. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., which it currently is. 5, 5 p.m.? Uh, so where it says, where it said 5 p.m., it normally said uh, two-hour parking from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., It's the, the amendment would be to 6 p.m. Do I, do I make 
Okay, so moved. Second. Can I Just speak, to, speak to that? Yeah. The, uh, this this has been around for a very long time, and the original version that came out of transportation and parking in 2011 was till five. The temporary ordinance that was approved in 2012 was from eight to six, and the street is posted now eight to six. So the ordinance committee. Uh, is requesting you change it from eight to six so that it reflects the posting on the street and the hours that were used for the temporary ordinance. That's why. That's why the change. So you wouldn't. Need to we wouldn't. Re if this happens, we wouldn't need to re-sign the street, and it would be the same as what the 120-day test was. Any further discussion on the? Amendment? Just a uh, just a point of clarification. We're, we're we're merely voting on the amendment to add it to the ordinance. We're not voting whether we approve or disapprove of the ordinance itself. Yeah, this is just a, an amendment to adjust the time okay. on the ordinance. Okay. Yep. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That's the amendment. Uh, now back to the general motion. Is there any conversation? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I came in, into this a little. Um, information. Is there is there a motion on the floor? No. So move. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't Thank I you. didn't I do the initial motion? No. no. Yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it it is. seconded. Okay, it is moved it in the okay. <laughs> yeah, Things are moving quickly. Shoot, <laughs> you So I was going to say I came into this because um, the Middle Street issue seems somewhat similar to an issue on the street I live in, uh, live on, with a another. It's not a business. It's a nonprofit. So the. The YMCA, the Hampshire YMCA, when I first moved in about 20 years ago, was not doing so well. And by not doing so well, it meant that its parking lot was perfectly suitable for everybody who came there. And now the Y has done better and better. It's actually an extremely vibrant place. If you don't belong, I'd encourage you to belong. It's also a great organization. And what's happened is that now we have parking up and down the street on Massasoit Street. What's interesting, and, and because I've gone to Middle Street and seen the same thing, is we haven't been able to get agreement from the neighbors themselves on Massasoit about whether it's a problem or not a problem. And so when some folks from Middle Street spoke, I was somewhat confused, and I'd like someone from Parking and Transportation to clarify, because on the one hand, a safety issue. So let's look at the safety issue, because one of the issues on Massasoit Street that a number of neighbors have spoken to is that if you have cars parked on the street, it's actually a traffic calming issue, which is a safety issue. Now, I'm not sure whether Middle Street would have the same kind of speeding that would go on, but then somebody spoke from Pine Street and made the case that Pine Street, people are speeding down Pine Street. Well, we know now that one of the ways to keep cars from not speeding down a street is to have cars parked on a street. So that's one thing that I've learned over the years, and that a lot of the neighbors on Massasoit, when we're having our arguments, are saying, wait a minute. We actually like having the cars parked on the street. So that was one issue. The second issue was I was a little confused when a couple, one neighbor spoke about the fact that there was a quality of life issue by having people parked on the street all day. And I'm just wondering, would that be different if people were coming in and out every two hours? So it just, it doesn't, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me in terms of a quality of life issue. If I'm living on a street, I'd rather have, so again, somebody who's been involved in this longer. On my street, I have cars for people who are the staff at the Y, with which, which is what we've tried to work out, are parked there all day, across the street. When the staff is not parking there, and people are coming in and out of those parking spaces, even when some of those parking spaces are empty half the day, I'll tell you from a resident on the street, I'd rather just have somebody who parks there first thing in the morning and leaves in the afternoon. Now, if the safety issue is about pulling out of your driveway and not having visibility, that's something that should be dealt with whether you're on Middle Street and you have this issue or anywhere in the city. You should have visibility. And you should call your counselor in that ward and say, look, when the parking that's currently allowed, when I pull out of my driveway, I have a safety issue then there should be signage that's, that stops you from parking that closely. You should not have to deal with that. It has nothing to do with the parking on Middle Street, professional or not. That's just an issue that nobody should have to deal with if it's unsafe to pull out of your driveway. Finally, and again, it, it left me a little confused, that some of the residents were saying the doctors are parked there all day and the staff. I thought that is what the doctors are saying they want to do. Of course there are no patients there. 
That's, so, so I got confused and it kind of moved me towards not supporting the ordinance because that is exactly the intent, is to park there all day so that the patients, so one of the folks who spoke against this said they don't see any patients there. Well, that's the issue. The patients would then have to walk down the street. So although I came into this thinking, well, I really want to hear more about it. I didn't know how I would vote on this. I would like someone to kind of address on the, on the council who's been working specifically with those issues and convince me that I should support this ordinance because right now I would vote against it and I mostly would vote against it because not because of the, what the doctor said, because of the contradictions of people living on the street. And let me just say again, those are the same contradictions that are happening now on Massasoit Street, which is why we haven't been able to come even with residents on the street with any resolution to how we work with the Y on this. So through the years, what's happened is the Y staff is trying to have their staff park on the street and people coming into the Y park in the parking lot. I also want to say I don't think a couple of the, um, the temporary issues or the experiments were ever put in place. And I think that's, I think there are, are some, some temporary things that could be tried. Councilor Adams was pointing out to me earlier that there was, that there was a statement a number of years ago that they would attempt to experiment with putting lines in there. So I'm just going, well, why weren't those kind of things at least tried before we, we changed the, the, uh, the parking situation in Toto? So I'm open to hearing the arguments on the other side and being swayed back the other way. Uh, Councilor Murphy and then Councilor I guess it would be me to explain since it's my ward and it's been in ordinance for some time. Did you happen to get the short history? Did you read the short history? Yes, history? I did. Yep. That, that pretty much explains it. But this problem has been around this building for a while. It started on Main Street and the business owners on Main Street because they, they, they had a parking location on Main Street but the signs were never put up so they put the signs up there. That kind of shifted it over to Pine Street and to Middle Street. So um, that's when it became a problem there. This has been kicking around. I looked at my emails back to 2010. In 2011, the residents went to transportation and parking and made their case. I think Councilor Carney was chairing at the time that this was an issue, and, and the ordinance that we're voting on tonight originates in 2011. So it's been at the ordinance committee for a while, and we've been trying to mitigate it since then, you know, for basically two years. Um, and that's why it's come here, because after two years, it was just time to move it on. Um, I will agree that the, the, that the staff parks on Middle Street uh, in consideration of their patients whom they want to park in the parking lot at their building. So it's a, a noble reason that they're doing that. Um, but it is a problem for the residents on Middle Street because every parking space uh, on the Ch Chestnut Street end is occupied all day long. I think one of the things that started us was somebody had a family funeral and they couldn't have people back to their house because there was no parking because it's occupied all day long. You, you, you can't park there. Um, I've polled the residents several times. Um, and in fact, this ordinance only deals with the 600 and something feet from Chestnut down because once you get away from the problem, the other residents couldn't get consensus because nobody parks that far down because it's not convenient. So this only covers the end near Chestnut, not the end near Maple because they did not respond in a positive way towards that. So it's focused on one end of Middle Street. It also isn't a ban, it simply says, you can only park for two hours between eight in the morning and six at night. So it does permit parking, it just doesn't permit eight hour parking. Um, so that the residents have a shot at perhaps somebody parking in front of their home uh, at some time during the day. Uh, people on Pine Street have got something in front of transportation parking now, I believe, for, for mitigation for, for speed, um, because there really are a through street. Middle Street, though it's a through street, doesn't really get you anywhere. So it isn't so much speed and it isn't so much safety as it is just having the street parked up all day long and it really is only the middle street end of the street because that's short walking distance. Now the folks at the medical building, and I'm a patient of one of the practices there and I go there, um, they have done their best. They have leased as many spaces from the church nearby that they can lease um, and I think in here I put a photo of the fact that, yeah, they do, and there's reserved spaces there for them. But it, it isn't sufficient to, you know, to solve things. I included a photo of, of the bank and the, and, and the Goggins real estate office. They have posted their lot. 
no unauthorized parking because there is a problem in the neighborhood, as has the medical building. They posted their lot just for their patients. Now, Chestnut Street in that area is one hour parking. Middle Street is going for two hour parking. They're not going for resident only. They're not going for no parking at all. They just say, give us two hours so things move around. When this came to ordinance, we decided, hey, let's do a 120 day test as a temporary ordinance, which we all voted on. And that test ran, I think, May, June, and July last year. After the test, I repolled the neighbors and they said, they thought it was helpful and successful. Um, we did attempt after the September ordinance meeting to get DPW to mark parking spaces on Middle Street to see if that helped. And DPW, given Storm Sandy and everything else, they were unable to get it done before winter, which is why we are where we are, because it came back up at ordinance again. And we said, you know, it's still a problem. The neighbors still want it. We have this position from the medical building that they want no restriction. The neighbors would like two hours. Spaces or no spaces, the problem isn't going away. Uh, and it isn't so much the problem even now that we're close to driveways or that there's accidents. It's just that there's never a parking space available in front of your home during business hours. Um, so we tried a test. The neighbors liked the test. Um, we were unable to get the spaces marked because of time constraints at DPW. And this is a, not, this is a 2011 ordinance, and it's 2013. It really deserved to come here and, and get voted on. Um, the, you know, the signs are up. They're covered at the moment because the ordinance is no longer in force. It really comes down to the neighbors would like the two-hour parking, not no parking, just two-hour. And the medical building folks, they have a need for parking. Um, Valley Medical bought another lot and put up another parking lot. It's a little harder in this situation because there really is nothing nearby where you can do that conveniently. So we have this dilemma. It's up really up to the council to decide what direction you want to take in it. But uh, the, that's kind of how we got where we are. It really, you know, temporary or, or patches really have been tried and we're here to deal with it tonight. Councilor Adams, then, um, then Council LaBarge, and then Councilor Schwartz, and then Councilor Spector. I'll defer to Councilor Spector if you want to respond directly. I just want to ask another question. Could you address the issue of if parking is, is the challenge at the medical building, and so if the doctors start parking I in that space, which they did over the summer, I'm not mm -hmm. sure of the summer test. I guess if the, what's your sense of the neighbors if people are not, if there are a lot of spaces, so there's limited space, so the patients are going to have to be going parking in and out of the two-hour parking there. So I, th I think what I'm hearing you say is that what the neighbors want is not for somebody to be there all day in case they want to park there during the day. And they would rather have that than have cars coming in and out. So then they got a shot at one of those two-hour yeah. spaces. Yeah. But let me just, can I just ask you this? Did they talk about the fact that in front of their own house, they won't be able to park for more than two hours? Because that's an issue that certainly came up on our street. And people were like, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. So if I have a friend come over who does park there, I'm going to have to move the car every two hours? Well, that's one of the reasons we did the 120-day test, because it's easy to say you'd like the restriction. But I think ordinance had some insight to say, let's let them live with it for a while and see if they really do like it. You know, is, that, is this a reality that works for them, and that's why ordinance said let's only put it forward as a 120-day test it, to see if it worked. And when I polled them, I polled them, at, okay. mailed them, and polled them afterwards, and by and large, they said we're more comfortable with that restriction. Okay. You know, Councilor, just not. just one last question. Thank you for sure. sure. So, the, and the test was June, July, and August. It was May, June, and July, and then okay. I wrote them wrote them in August. So it was it was in the summer. You know, it was a good time because there wasn't snow on the roads. You know, it was, it was a good time to do the test. Because Is there, are there more concern. patients, less patients in the summer, or just about the same well, amount, I think, you know? I think what we saw was then um, it, it, it switched around because um, it was probably more patients. Now, I know there, there are some staff at the medical building. You know, the, the physicians come and go. They go to the hospital. They come back. So sometimes it works for them, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. And if you come back... At four o'clock, you're probably safe because at six o'clock it ends. Uh, so I think it was it was a mixed bag, but it did it did turn over um, when it was the two hour. And I did I at least was able to pull the neighbors 
and they said they thought it was an improvement with the two-hour parking. Um, okay. So. Uh, Councilor Adamson, Councilor Labarge, and then um, one of my concerns is what Councillor Spector touched on that uh, for those residents who are seeing mostly staff and doctors uh, parking there early in the morning going to work um, if this if this ban is in, is instituted they will see um, sick um, patients sometimes elderly patients in these spots um, walking to the business um, my main concern is that there is a compromise between the the liaison from from the medical building and the residents and that that was never realized that compromise could have solved the problem it could have solved the problem for the residents and it could have made the street safer potentially and i understand the dpw was tied up and couldn't couldn't get to it couldn't couldn't um, implement it but i could possibly support this but certainly not until that that experiment was given a shot because that could solve everyone's problem and be less restrictive so I'm um, voting no um, if on this on on the motion itself, but I would be in support of postponing it um, indefinitely to give the DPW the chance to um, paint the lines. Council Labarge. Um, I'm having a problem with this ordinance. First, if we look what has occurred that the experiment of putting the lines in were not done because of the weather, apparently. I feel if we're going to do something, we should look at it the right way. Let's try to put the lines in place first under an experiment. I think when we're going a two hour parking, I have a problem with that because who is going to enforce that? That's my question. Is our parking enforcement going to have the time to come every two hours to check to see if the same vehicle is there? I also have a problem about the speeding because we deal with speeding and I have concerns with that and I really feel that that should go to parking and transportation for calming. But to put a limit on staff, no matter where you're working, on how you only can park for two hours is something to look at. I do agree about quality of life on any street, but to just go ahead and say, no, this is it, we're putting two hour parking in without even attempting to do the experiment of placing the lines. And I think we need to keep in mind that an ordinance, and I think Councillor Carney, I don't know if you were involved with Councillor Fran Volkman and I, on an ordinance that is in place that you cannot park near a driveway within three feet. So is all this being looked at? I would like to see the owners of the medical building and plus the residents with the liaison from the medical building and transportation and parking try to come to a good compromise here and i think that can be done but to just put immediately two hours parking on that street i i just don't and i can't agree to that without trying the lines first council schwartz would you uh, allow council murphy to respond I guess uh, of course questions. sure mm -hmm. um well, there, there's nothing immediate about this. As I mentioned, this has been going on since 2011. In fact, the ordinance we're voting on was sent. It is sponsored by Transportation and Parking based on a presentation made to them in 2011. So this is not something that really snuck up on us here. Um, and in, in my short history, I mentioned that uh, back when Mr. Latender was still with us, that's how long this goes back, he did have his staff go up and mark the appropriate distances from driveways and fire hydrants and corners and things. So that, that has been tested, you know, those marks are there. And that isn't so much an issue anymore. Uh, the, 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 the parking division comes to Florence now. There, there are parking restrictions in Florence. You can't park in Florence. Many, spa many spaces are one hour limit. So the parking people do come to Florence now and do enforce a parking limit on Main Street in Florence and Maple Street in Florence already. So it's not like they're not going up there. 
Uh, this one will be different because it's two hours, it's more lenient, but they're already going up there and they're already enforcing it and, and that, is in fact, that is in fact the case. And as to the marking of the spaces, we, we came up with that in September thinking that would be a last step, but it isn't so much at this point that you know, we've sort of solved the too close to driveway things. The problem is it's all day and a space doesn't stop all day. You know, you, you'll be not too close to a driveway, not too close to a corner, but you'll still be there all day, and that really is the issue. So we can mark spaces, but if you can stay there all day, that still doesn't solve the problem that is the basis for this ordinance, and that is that unless you got parking in your driveway, you can't have somebody come to visit you between 8 o'clock and 6 o'clock because they got to park 600 feet down the street because the spaces are occupied all day. And so that while we thought it would be helpful, it really doesn't change the basic issue for the residents, and that is that there's no parking in front of their house all day. Councilor Schwartz and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. I really feel for the situation. I feel like um, <clears throat> I walked in here uh, thinking I was um, against the ordinance um, and and just just. Uh, recognizing that there's always a give and take and it's just an imperfect situation and that um and that the two hour limit wasn't the way to go as i hear as i heard the residents i i and i started to compute well why isn't it the owner's responsibility to work out their parking problem and i started to move that way and then i have to say at the end of the day i'm i'm stuck still because mm -hmm. the owners are trying to work out the parking problem and they can't and and it and it feels like an intractable situation and i feel like nobody's winning here i mean a nobody's winning and 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 i don't th if i thought that the 2 hour limit would would make the win would, then i could support it but i don't believe that it does sufficiently <coughs> to cancel out the reality that this business is there they're locked in on their parking they they are they have patients they have staff they they've released spaces the other you know the, the other lots that are where there are spaces are empty are not open to them i it doesn't seem like a reasonable decision to simply cut the street off not only and especially because of what you get in return i appreciate that the residents are saying the poll residents are saying we like it when there's some rotation but on balance that rotation when you can you you could have the the, res, the the patients are still going in out you could even get staff could get fancy and you know rotate themselves every two hours i mean and, and it, it doesn't feel like a meaningful solution it doesn't feel like a, even though i'm here and i'm not refuting the fact that residents are saying it is I, I, I hear that residents have said it is an improvement, but it doesn't feel on balance, given the whole of the situation, like an appropriate remedy for the community as a whole. And I really want to say I'm just so sorry. I'm just so sorry that it's, there isn't an, ac an adequate fix right now. And I feel like at minimum, while you're saying the spacing is not uh, – it doesn't it doesn't deal with the fact that their car was a car is there all day it does seem like it could address the safety issue i mean around around visibility getting out of a driveway and mm -hmm. and I, I do feel like okay there's something there's something to give um and i would like to see that spacing those lines happening happen um and i i feel like on balance i can't support the ordinance but i'm really sorry about it um Councilor freeman daniels and then Councilor murphy uh, would like a chance to respond so oh, if you want to respond um, I, you know, I wish, I wish we'd been fiddling with this since 2011. And when you're in a finite world, you have to come up with some sort of proposal. You know, if it has to take the form of an ordinance, it has to be something that will meaningfully contribute and also be able to be defined in an ordinance. And there is no perfect solution. The folks at the medical building, that building was properly permitted. It has the requisite number of spaces it needed for its floor space, but as it, as it turns out, there's healthy, thriving medical practices there that have a greater demand for parking than what our zoning ordinance uh, requires. And it's, it's a good thing. I mean, I'm very pleased that Main Street and my ward is doing so well. You know, unfortunately, 
there's this conflict and we're going to hear from it from Pine Street very shortly because it, it's a problem for them too and they're also asking for some mitigation there so uh, I don't hold the medical building at fault they're properly permitted they're just doing really well and they have a lot of patients and, and their space and uh, I would if you got a better idea for how to come up with some way to mitigate this other than this we you know what came from two years of trying was two hours and it, it seemed to help um, the the marking of spaces I wish it could have been done I wish when this came up now we could say we had it and we have some results from that but given the the, the load at DPW they just didn't get it done um, if if you would like I'm happy to move to continue this until June so that there's time for them to do it I mean I'd appreciate you suggesting that they get around to it so that we can really tell but uh, you know I'm if somebody wants a second I'll move to continue this you know in in till our first meeting in June to give them time to do that to see what happens I'll second that yeah. well, motion to table to the there's a motion to table which is not debatable well, no, it was to, to continue well, postpone yeah, continue. postpone until the it's first debatable. So, so it is debatable yeah, uh, 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 Council Freeman Daniels, I'll defer to you because you were next in line. Uh, and this is in the motion to table. Oh, uh, to postpone, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, um, I'm also, I'd be in support of the motion to postpone um, for many of the reasons that, uh, that, that Councilor Schwartz and um, and Council LaBarge um, put forward. So I don't have much more to add there. Uh, I do think that um, this is a, an incident of a larger problem that we have in the city, um, and that's and that's a con and that's the conflict between um, residential streets and and commercial districts and the parking that employees will use and. Uh, um, and I don't mean to be flippant about this to residents of Middle Street, but you should come down to Ward 3 a little bit because uh, we, have, we have many streets that have that, that, have that same problem. And uh, it was one of the major f factors for my um, driving so hard on the Transportation and Parking Commission to create a parking committee, to so reconstitute the parking committee. And, and uh, I just wrote an order the other day to, to create the parking committee, which will happen in February, I, I hope. Uh, and one of their charges is to uh, look at the um, the uh, possible um, this conflict, possible solutions, resident-only parking or permit parking, or um, some sort of pay system, um, or uh, some other kind of solution. And and I think that uh, voting on this two-hour um, restriction is uh, premature. To that, uh, I, I know that. This has been a while, around for a long time. Um, I, I'm sorry that uh, that we didn't have a parking committee before. It was really not really not needed before, and I think that it's become n needed more in uh, the the center of Northampton, in wards three and four, uh, in wards two, and um, and now, of course, in Florence. So uh, I think that um, we should wait. Uh, we should try to reduce the parking spaces on the street by by putting lines in because it will displace some employees who will park further away. I think that will probably be one of the upshots to it, and uh, they might find that uh, walking uh, a little bit from the from the church or wherever might not be so bad. I think that uh, that we should wait on this, and I also think that the parking committee will um, hopefully take up this issue when it gets constituted. So I, I would. I'd be in favor of postponing. Uh, Council Tacey. <clears throat> the, um, this parking, parking and parking um, is an issue that um, has gone on here for, I don't know how many years, but for the 30 or so years that I've actually paid attention to the city and come to these meetings over 30 years, I remember when we had businesses that have to buy a parking space from the city. And it went from, I think, $4,000 to $7,000, then to $11,000, then to $18,000. And in a precedent that you set, whether it's an inconvenience or a safety issue, you set a precedent where every, you're going to have two hour parking on streets that are close to the downtown business district. The, conven the convenience of you buying the house there is because it's close to the district. 
One of the inconveniences might be that there's going to be more traffic. You're going to be closer to downtown. I'd like to have trucks not go by my house on North Maple Street. I live on a thoroughfare uh, that is, and, and it's all safety, it's speed, it's everything. But the the precedent that you said, if you do two hours on one street, is is it we open the floodgates for? I know they mark tires. The traffic enforcement officers mark tires on Middle Street, and what they found with the two hours was that. People moved their cars from one space to another. They swapped their cars around. And that, should that continue? Is that less of an inconvenience for the, the neighborhood? Uh, the, I wonder how long the, si the signs were unbagged and how long did the experiment really go? Did it, was it just May, June, and July? Or I think, when did the, the signs get bagged? It was just a few, couple of months ago, wasn't it? Or three months ago? Um, so the experiment really went on for a long time, but we never did get the lines painted. And I think that's, that's a problem for me. We did not get the lines painted. It was something that we could try that's probably of a lesser, a little less draconian than, uh, than the two-hour parking. I, I, no matter what you do here, uh, somebody's not going to be happy. It's, not, it's just not going to work out. Well, we're, we're spe the motion is to postpone, so uh, please, I, I've allowed everyone to kind of run who haven't been able to comment before on this issue to run a little beyond that in their in their opining but uh, um, if you please consider the motion thank you and um, even though this is on the motion to postpone I'll, I'll just uh, digress slightly you're, you're allowed I allowed everyone. thank you um, <laughs> just to reiterate some of the points that Councillor Freeman Daniels made and that um, with the establishment of the Parking Committee now in the uh, Transportation and Parking Commission, it, you know, it, it really seems appropriate to think of this in a broader context of, uh, of that tension that exists between businesses and residents all across the city. And um, I'm not sure that it's appropriate to take this particular ordinance and send it back there right now, but I do think that um, this is not an unusual situation, as, as other people have, have mentioned. And so um, I certainly support postponing. I support um, looking at the marking, marking issue and seeing if that makes it any better. But as Councillor Murphy said, you know, the issue for residents there is that there's a car parked all day. And in fact, we heard one, we heard one resident say that um, they may come out and park their car all day. <laughs> so it, in any event, there will be cars parked on Middle Street, whether they're residents or whether they're um, employees uh, of the 10 Main Street. And, um, you know, I guess that makes sense. I mean, those, there's, there are spots there and they will be occupied. It's just who will be in them. So um, I will support the postponement. And, and, and one more thing, I know that it's uh, kind of anathema to mention the residential only parking, but the one part that I just looked at here in the mention of uh, residential need, it says that na neighborhood permit parking may be considered for districts in which at least 75% of available legal on-street parking spaces are filled during the program hours and at least 50% of the vehicles parked are non-resident. Now, I was not on the council when this was passed, and maybe my colleague, well, Councilor Spector, was, but um, <laughs> there are things on the books. There are other ways. I know folks have said they don't want to do that, but it might be appropriate. Any more discussion on the motion to postpone? Well, I think, <laughs> I think you know, it seems that we'll have an opportunity to visit this yeah. again and, and flesh out our, our eight points and, and and I'm sure we'll hear from all the folks who've uh, bided their time here. I appreciate that. I will stop opining. Okay. Uh, so the motion is to postpone. Is uh, Can I have a vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is postponed. First in to the first meeting in June. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. All right. Now we're we're back to the original agenda, and we'll, we'll wait for the room to clear a little bit. Thanks. So actually, in the in the process, why don't we just move for approach, uh, approval of minutes? You want to take five? Move to approve. Second. 
All those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I, I, I'm sorry. Minutes of the 17? 17. Yes. Yes. I will abstain. I was not here. Got it. Oh. Did I hear a take five? Well, the uh, Council Murphy is called, asked for a recess. Is the Council like to recess for five minutes? Thank you. Who's asked for recess? All right. We're in recess for uh, seven minutes precisely. Do we? Welcome back. We're coming out of recess, the City Council meeting for February 7, 2013. Uh, and we're getting back into the agenda, which oddly enough is right at the beginning of the agenda, um, under proclamations, resolutions, and awards. I don't believe that we have any standing. Do we have a resolution, the announcement of the living wage? I'm sorry? Are we announcing the living wage? Uh, that's coming up. That's the next thing in the one-minute announcements. Uh, and actually, before that, preceding that will be the announcement. Now, Uh uh, as you heard in public comment, uh, the living wage resolution unanimously passed by the Northampton City Council on December 3rd, 2009, setting living, set a living wage at $11.90 per hour. And the living wage rate is based on a basic needs budget for a single person without children. The resolution includes the following provision requiring annual adjustments in the living wage to keep pace with the cost of living. In order to ensure that living wages keep pace with the cost of living, annual adjustments to the living wage should be based on the percentage of increase above annual average consumer price index as of December 31st. Each year, the Northampton Living Wage Coalition shall provide the Human Rights Commission with the current living wage data. The Human Rights Commission shall convey the new living wage figure and the supporting data to the City Council, and this annual adjustment will be shall be publicly announced by the Northampton City Council within one month of receiving the information from the Human Rights Commission, the Northampton Living Wage Resolution. So in 2011, the living wage was increased from $11.90 to $12.09 per hour based on a 1.6 percent increase in the consumer price index during 2010. The consumer price index increased by 3.6 percent during 2011, which brought the living wage to $12.52 an hour. And in 2012, the CPI went up by 2.1 percent, which brings now the living wage for 2013 to $12.78. In 2013, there were increases in the index for several basic needs that include 3.6 percent increase for household fuel oil, 3.2 percent increase in medical care, 1.9 percent increase for shelter, 2.7 percent increase for rent, 1.7 percent increase for gasoline, 1.8 percent increase for food, and 1.8 percent uh, increase in clothes. And the living wage is based on basic needs budget for the single person with no children. As we said, prices rose less than in 2011. However, the basic needs increase of 3.6 percent for the household fuel oil. 3.2% for medical care and 2.7% for rent, 1.7% for gasoline, food, 4.6% for clothing, and 1.9% for housing make it hard for Northampton workers who earn below $12.78 to make ends meet. Uh, and by the way, I should note, uh, mention that uh, employers can get certification forms from the coalition's website at www.livingwagewesternmass.net. Uh, and Employers who are not currently paying $12.78 $12 can get credit for paying basic needs benefits, or they can uh, certify as aspiring employers. And aspiring employers are employers who cannot now pay a living wage but agree to make progress toward paying a living wage. All right. Now, uh, on one minute announcements, um, I actually like to. I'm going to start by saying that upon advice of the city's emergency management director, Mayor David Narkowitz announces that all city of Northampton offices will close at noon tomorrow, Friday, February 8th. Uh, also, Northampton Public Schools are closed Friday. And then I would like to, the, the city clerk has an announcement. <laughs> she's, she's got things for you. She'll be passing these out. This is uh, relative to uh, state ethics. Uh, uh, obligations. Well, basically, every municipal employee has to sign an acknowledgement of receipt of the conflict of interest. And you can return that to me, please, before March 1st. Don't do 
test. Um, test. Cool. Then the second item is on an email from HR on how to take the mandatory online training. You'll have to print out a certificate that will have to also be returned to me to go to HR uh, hopefully by March 15th. Do they if you have any difficulty with your computer or you need help, um, the human resources are available to help you. The training takes approximately an hour. It's mostly audio. Um, so uh, if you have any difficulty. Is there a way that we can transmit these things electronically or does it has to be printed out? We prefer that it be printed out. Well, I don't want to come across them, so it yeah. two choices to save it or to print it. It's, it's actually better if you... Print it out for HR. If we were to sign it and then send it to you, would that you be? Sign the one that is on the top there, but the yeah. other has to be a certificate. Okay. If we were to print that out and sign it and send it to you. Oh, I see. Okay. And then turn it into you. Yes. I'm halfway there. Okay. Any other announcements, uh, Council Labarge, and then Council Tate. Yes. Um, Mary. Is this the one that we take the test? Mm -hmm. But what if we already did that? Every year? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Questions, Questions get harder. <laughs> I just um, <clears throat> I want to recognize the, uh, the passing of Jack Fenton, uh, retired North Oakland firefighter, um, a friend of my family's in the community. Um, he was sent out today and laid to rest in grand fashion um, by the Northampton Fire Department, along with the Northampton Police Department, did a, a great job. It was uh, it was befitting of Jack Fenton. Um, <clears throat> you often hear uh, in this, these chambers that people talk about the weave and um, and the fabric of community, and and that's that is these people. Um, and Jack Fenton is um, was was a, not only a good citizen. He, did, he donated his life or dedicated his life to public service, public safety. Um, also, he was a coach for the Northampton Little League. He coached uh, the Northampton Youth Football. Um, and it was just, it, it was a moving event today. Um, I won't get into too much, but I want to um, uh, offer at least my condolences to um, his mother, uh, Joan, and his two brothers, Dave and Tom. Uh, I won't get into the rest of the family members because I could be here for a long time. I don't ever remember not knowing the Fentons. They've been fabulous people, uh, and we will miss Jack Fenton very much. He was uh, in my ward, a good neighbor, a good friend, and I just want to quote what his son had said at the Mass today that his father, Jack, had said to him, don't ever be afraid of the ball. Don't be afraid of the ball. And it goes further than just an element of a sports event. It's whatever life throws at you. And um, I will miss Jack very much. Thank you. Thank you for that recognition. And, and please extend our condolences as well. That's, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. So I, I just spoke about the parking committee and how uh, it's going to be tackling some tough issues. And uh, last month, the Transportation Parking Commission was unable to get the uh, all of the um, members of the public that it needed to constitute the parking committee so we uh, delayed constituting it until this month so if anyone wants to apply for the parking committee of the transportation parking commission the application is online at the home page of the transportation parking commission and i think applications will be due by the 17th 17th which was which is when our, we'll have our meeting and hopefully constitute the parking committee Excellent. Application still being accepted. People are standing by the phones. <laughs> uh, any other announcements? Is that you're raising your hand, Councilor Murphy? No. Oh, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> <laughs> any other announcements? No. Okay, we'll move on then. Uh, we have a late file for a taxi cab license. Uh, accept a motion for. Suspend rule 38. Thank Second. You. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Um, someone want to move this? Move to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? 
It appears that uh, all taxes are paid. Everything's paid to date. Uh, Councilor, I read the uh, the paperwork on it, and um, is this? Does he? It said. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm, I forget what he called the taxi cab. Funky, Funky cab. cab. Yeah. And then later on, it says in here, Mercedes Cab Company. I think this is uh, what I understood this to be was a subsidiary, essentially. Uh, uh, um, uh, Mercedes Cab Company doing business as Funky Cab. Let's see. Mercedes Cab Company Incorporated doing business as Funky Cab. I'll move to recognize Ms. Lynch if she wants to explain. She's in the gallery. Second. Please. Yeah. Second. Just. Uh, this is Don Lynch, who's the general manager. Hello. Um, yes, indeed. Mercedes Cab Incorporated is the sort of main corporation, and we are running a DBA out here. So it's a subsidiary of that company. So the location of the Mercedes cab Our main offices are in Provincetown, and then we have um, an office on Holly Street for Funky Cab here. Okay. And how many cabs do you run? Currently, we just have one. Um, obviously, we plan to expand as the business dictates. Okay. So this is it. This is the start. For Northampton, yes, exactly. How many cabs do you have elsewhere? Um, our entire fleet, when you count all of the names that we run under, we probably have almost 30 vehicles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor of granting the license? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Uh, now comes the time in our meeting where we recess for finance. And I pass over the gavel to the Chair of Finance, Councillor Murphy. Figuratively. Figuratively passing the gavel. It's just going to stay right there. There, it's going to stay right there. Uh, Mary, could you call the roll of finance? Present. Here. And if you'll indulge me, um, the financial orders we have tonight can be explained in the report of the finance director, but it, they're out of order. So do you all mind if we recognize Susan and have her do her finance report, and then she'll address the orders that will then move to us. Second. Thank you. So you're on. Um, Finance Director's report tonight is basically a six-month picture of where our city's revenues and expenditures are going, and I'm basically talking just about the general fund. Uh, for revenues, on, a whole, on the whole, they're trending in line with our estimates. Um, a few things that I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, if you looked at the comparison that I gave you, it's, it's looking at where we were for several fiscal years at the six-month mark. Um, there doesn't seem to be very much in this particular printout under motor vehicle, and that's because a large commitment's going out this week for $1.7 million, consisting of about 19,000 bills. So that's going out this week, so that line will start seeing some numbers come in. Um, hotel motel taxes are running about uh, slightly higher than last year, about $10,000 higher. Meals tax are about $4,000 lower than this time last year. So both of them are pr running pretty much at what we estimated. Um, billing for the pilots, you can see on the um, revenue sheet, there's nothing that's come in on those. The pilot bills, which is payment and lower taxes, aren't set out and sent out until after we set the tax rate. So those went out in January. Uh, parking revenues, you'll notice, have been divided into four categories this year. Um, for many years, parking revenues have all been lumped into one category, and we made the decision in the FY13 budget to break those out. Um, so we have parking revenues, garage revenues, meter revenues, and um, passes, parking passes. So that's why those four categories um, are broken out in this, and you don't see historicals for that. I'm still looking, Councillor Adams had asked about when we stopped. Um, doing parking garage revenues as four different sources, and I'm still trying to find that information out. Um, so you can see that parking revenues are about 8,000 behind the first half of last year. Um, so far, they're at 929,000. Ambulance revenues in FY13 are coming into the general fund for the first time because they used to be in the receipt reserve for appropriation. So that's why you don't see some historical data for that. 
Um, but in looking back at that receipt reserved account, um, the revenue for the first six months of this year is 804,000 compared with last year's six month mark, which was 734. Um, so we are ahead of this time last year, and we are at uh, just about 50% of the estimated revenues for the year. Um, licenses and permits, there's some good news here that Louis Hasbrook, our building inspectors, yes, estimating that permit revenues are going to exceed the <laughs> estimates by about $60,000 this year, which is great because having um, permits pick up means more new growth for us in FY14. Parking tickets are actually another uh, bright spot. Um, they're about $100,000 ahead of this time last year, but that's mainly due to the reorganization of the parking department. If you remember the first six months of last year, um, the parking department hadn't been reorganized. It was reorganized in January of last year. So it's not really that the parking tickets are up due to more aggressive ticketing. It's just that we actually have full staff there doing that. Um, on the expenditure side of things, um, most accounts are doing well. Payroll expenditures, overtime, everything seems to be running just as we would hope. There are three accounts that are running in the red, and we've prepared an order for you tonight to supplement those accounts with free cash. Um, unemployment as of January is 5000 in the negative, and I estimate we're probably going to need $40,000 more to get through this year. Uh, legal services account is currently in the positive, but we estimate we'll need 50000 If you remember when the FY13 budget was done, um, we made the conscious decision to add some to the legal budget because this is one of the areas that had historically been underfunded, and we added about 30000 But we're still about 50000 short of what our average over several years would be, so we need to supplement the legal services budget. Um, and that's mainly because of legal costs related to collective bargaining, settlement of the firefighter litigation, ongoing f uh, fire department joint labor management committee issues continue to strain that budget. And then lastly, the city clerk's office, as you know, um, is going to be very busy this spring. They have two more elections, one in April and one in June, and the additional election in November that was related to the, to the charter. Um, had already strained the budget and we knew we were going to need to add more. So the city's clerk, city clerk's overtime account is in deficit by $4,700 from the November election. She thinks she's going to need $2,000 more for the upcoming elections. Her election supply account is in deficit by $1,137 and she estimates she's going to need about $1,500 more for the upcoming election supplies. And then her election workers line item is, has only $960 in it, and she's going to need about thirteen dollars to $14,000 per election. Now, we will get some back from the state, but from what I understand from her is that we really only get reimbursed for three hours, which are the additional hours that we have to keep the polls open. So I'm recommending um, that we transfer to her line item enough to cover the April election. And then when we do more transfers in May, we'll, we'll transfer her more money for the June election. So those are the that is the transfer. All of these would be from free cash. And that's about it. Uh, Councilor Adams had a question. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand how parking tickets go up due to uh, reorganization. Is it because, is it what you're saying, because now there's full staff, meaning there's more staff out ticketing? Absolutely. Okay. The, yes. The, the positions were funded last year, but they weren't filled. Um, and one of the things that the, the mayor noticed when looking at the parking department is that we only had one person on on Saturdays where we were supposed to have two people. So there were a number of holes in the schedule that were realigned with the whole parking reorganization. So it's not that we have any more staff, this is staff that was budgeted but just wasn't being utilized. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Um, in the general, the, uh, general fund expenses, two thirds, employee benefits, is the retirement in that? In the printout that I gave you from Munis, retirement is actually a separate line item. It is, so it's, okay. So employee benefits are um, more like medical insurance. Um, okay, so retirement is it's, it equals like some four million bucks or something that we put in. Oh, for, that might be retirement. What page are you looking? Uh, at? No, I'm just I'm looking at uh, 
this uh, general fund expense of 2013. Oh, okay. Looking at these two, employee benefits and public safety. Okay, in that, employee retirement is included in that. It is. Yes. And so in public safety, is that, that includes police and fire? Right. And is the retirement in that $11 million, or is it No. It's all, just in the employee benefits line? Right, right. All of, in that particular pie chart, all of the employee benefits, which would be unemployment, Medicare, retirement, health insurance, are all in that one big thing. We don't break it out by department. Okay, and my next question is, we changed the retirement plan recently. We've gone from our fully funded in 2028 to 2036. We had to, we've, the retirement board voted to extend the funding schedule. We had to go from 2028 to 2036 because if we had not extended the funding schedule, the increase to the city in 14 would have been over a million dollars. Okay, so, and we've done a little plan uh, design change also. It's not the last three years now for your retirement amount. It is the last five years. Is that there? Are, there, those are plan design changes that the state made. This was not our local retirement board. We have to follow the state laws as far as retirement. But they have changed some um, aspects of it. I'm not sure. There's some grandfathering if you're currently. In, you know, if you're currently in the system, I'm not sure if, I think it's your three years. I'm not yeah. sure if it's your five. I know for new, re for new for employees. For new people, it's five years. Yes, it's your last, it's your highest five years rather than your highest three years. And do we have any idea just exactly what the impact is negatively or positive? I, I know it's a positive. Um, I'm we, just curious. I'm wondering as we go further down the line here, year after year after year, I wonder where we'll be like in 2019 or 20. Right. With retirements. I, I don't know. We have the retirement board has an actuarial evaluation every two years, yeah. and that basically looks at all of the investments over the last two prior two years, and then looks at the funding schedule, and then it does a mortality study, and it takes into account any new changes in the laws about retirement, and it factors all of that stuff in. And then it comes up with a new number that we need to meet in order to get this system to full funding by 2036. Okay. Was there a substantial difference in our uh, our um, add to our retirement this year over last year? I think it's. I think the pro previous year it was up 175, and in. In, I think that from 12 to 13, I think we went up 175, the city's assessment to the retirement. Yeah. And then going from 13 to 14, we're going up about 250, 260, I think. I can't remember. So had we, the, the retirement board had a number of choices as to where they wanted to set the new funding schedule. And the I think to go to 2034 was going to be an $800,000 increase to the city. So we went with 2036 to try to keep the increase to the city down as low as possible without going all the way up to, you could legally go as far as 2040. Okay. I, don't, I didn't ask that because I think retirements, are, I mean, yeah. retirement is something that we have to pay. We owe that. Right. We own the retirements. I just so, I was just curious as to how we were going and, and just exactly how much it does eat as we go along. Right. Okay. And, and part of it is the investment returns have been so low that the retirement system hasn't met what they use. They use a 7.75% yep. interest, and they weren't able to meet that the last couple of years. So that was one reason why our thing hit. So in a future actuarial study, if we start getting better interest rates and things start improving, that number might change and go down. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other report questions? Then while, while you're on a roll, would you uh, talk about the other two uh, financial issues? Would you start with the Verizon one that we're going to be voting on? Um, actually, Sorry. Vanessa is here to talk about the Verizon one. So do, would you like her to come up now? Well, or? Before she does, then, could you do the third order, the, the budgetary transfer of 20000 Because you talked about the free cash one. Okay. The third um, one. 
that one is relating to the mayor's presentation that's coming up. Um, but simply, we're taking $20,000, we're, we're asking that City Council take $20,000 from the salary line item in the mayor's office and move it to the OM line item, which would be contractual. And that is salary that is um, surplus because uh, Terry Masterson, the new economic development planner, didn't start until the last week of December. And his salary was budgeted for the full year. And that would be used for? That would be used I will for? I be presenting on that. Yes. So, yeah. But we'll be voting on this before you do that. Well, so we, we were hoping that, uh, that maybe the mayor can make his presentation in the finance committee. OK. Yeah. That's fine. So All right. So ready for Vanessa? Vanessa. Uh, what we are requesting is for you to vote uh, for us to enter in an agreement with Verizon for five years. I understand the city has a standard of after th three years agreement, the city council has to look at it and approve it. Uh, I submitted a spreadsheet, a very simple spreadsheet. Uh, we lease lines from Verizon for our phone system through state contract ITT 46. The state just uh, renew the contract and the rates have gone down but in order for us to benefit from that we have to enter an agreement with Verizon I sent them paperwork uh, they have term of 60 months or 36 months the 60 month agreement will give us the opportunity to benefit the best uh, the cost reduction on their 36 months agreement per month, uh, per, per year, I'm sorry, will be about $1,200. Uh, if we go into a 60 month agreement, it will be $4,500 per year, re cost reduction. I don't like to call them savings, I call them cost reductions. Um, the thing is that even if we engage in this five year agreement, the state contract provides that we can get out of the agreement at any point without any penalties. So, any uh, comfort? So, so uh, and I like you making the distinction of a cost reduction versus savings because, of course, if, if the rates were to go down below this mark, it wouldn't be a savings. In, but it's a savings compared to the current price and current rate that we're paying. Uh, that's that's an interesting option. You mentioning that option that we can we can opt out at any point in the contract sounds like the weirdest contract I've ever heard. But I don't I like the terms given the fact that we're so given if the rates were to precipitously drop and given that this is Verizon the likelihood of that seems pretty remote. But if it were to drop, then we were we have we can uh, get out of the the contract and then renegotiate uh, terms beyond that. Sorry. Case. Very simply, just exactly what is all of this for? Okay, this is, we have our phone system, the digital phone system, uh, that the service is provided through lease lines from Verizon. Uh, the five lines that you see on their digital line PRI, those are like the big fat pipes that uh, are used for communication through our phone system to the outside. So we have two lines at the fire department because of public safety concerns. So they have a line on the back of, for volumes also. We have two lines at MIS because we service the city. And then there's one line at the high school that services the school. So those are the PRI lines. It's the line that are uh, it's like your phone line at home, except that it's like a bigger fat pipe and uh, it connected to the digital system that we have. Then we have 153 copper lines. Those are the fax machine, those remain on copper. Uh, when we went to the new system three years ago, four years ago, we had over 600 lines, copper lines. So we would have been paying six, 600, let's say 600 for the sake of the argument, $12.75 per line for 600 lines. We paid for 153 only. So we eliminated more than 400 line copper lines. So our cost went down. Uh, so what this is telling you that the top of the spreadsheet is what we currently pay. 
for the line leases. So we pay for it seven thousand, almost forty eight hundred thousand uh, dollars <throat> for under the current state contract. From the new state contract, we were to engage in a three months agreement. Those are the new rates. So we'll only have a cost reduction of twelve hundred dollars. If we go into a sixty month agreement, then we have a cost reduction per year of forty four, almost forty five hundred dollars. So this is are these backup lines to our Comcast system? No, these are for phone. The Comcast system is for internet. That's separate. We don't have any we don't have any Comcast phone lines. No, we don't. That I know of. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> Phone services through Verizon, essentially. They're, they're the service provider and the digital and copper lines, the, the remaining copper, well, the digital fiber system for internet is Comcast. And which makes sense because Comcast actually offers broadband with a higher capacity and volume and speed. Verizon wouldn't, certainly copper wires wouldn't. Vanessa, to follow up, the the do you anticipate any more reduction in copper line service? Um, I don't think so at this point. Uh, I know that they have been looking at the alarms to convert it into radio signals. So we have to look at that. Uh, it was tricky because a lot of those lines were tied also to faxes, so they were dual purpose, so we couldn't really eliminate them. We already eliminated one that we found out after the fact that it was an elevator at the police department, so we rushed to That's <laughs> reinstate it. Several, a little, one, a little follow up, but sure. uh, Councilor Barge. Yes, thank you. Um, I know us councilors had passed an order on money for a consultant to go through the department several months ago. Are they there now working in your department on reorganizing or? Are they involved in this too? No, we just had uh, the mayor's technology committee just had the first meeting today. So one of the things we are looking at is uh, about contracting with a consultant. So we're not there yet. Any other questions for Councilor Tacey? Yeah, I'm just, I'm still confused about the phone system, I guess, in the city. I guess I'm just not that, that technically advanced. But I was under the impression that we were moving away from Verizon to Comcast solely, and it was going to be a huge savings uh, on our phone system. I, the, the, I think the voice over IP system is distributed by Comcast, but the actual delivery of the lines is still Verizon. So we do. So we will. We continue to get bills from Verizon and Comcast. We have been getting bills from Verizon and Comcast for the internet line that we have for web browsing purposes, etc. Uh, we paid a hundred, less than hundred and twenty dollars per month from Comcast. We could never get the same capacity from at this point from other providers for that cost. It will be significantly more, probably in the order of over over a thousand dollars. So I guess my question would be, uh, we were going to cut our phone bill in half with this new phone system. Did that actually happen? Uh, I guess yes. I don't have. I get. I came I, early I, before. I don't expect to answer that right now. But I would. I'd like at some point to see just exactly if there are. They sold us on or the city council a savings of 50 percent of our phone bill. That was going to cut our phone bill in half when we provided this funding mm -hmm. to change our whole phone system. And I really was not aware that. Verizon would still be in the mix. I thought we were dumping Verizon, going with Comcast, the OIP, whatever. I, it's just that was my understanding. But my understanding also was that we were going to save 50 percent of what we were paying for phone service by going to Comcast. So I would like to see that somehow in writing or in black we, and white. We, we are saving money. We were with Verizon for the phone system. Under the, we were purely Centrix line, which are copper line. There were over 600 lines. So if you take 1275 per 600 line, it were more than that, but for 600 line and uh, calculate the annual amount, we're saving money because we reduce the amount of copper lines. Um, I can work the numbers for you and send you an email later, but I can probably also try to look at the 
account that was under central services before it was transferred to MIS and see what their expenses were. It might be tricky also because they might have been paying other things, but we'll try to figure out what was Verizon and what was something else. Well, there were savings. Yeah. Okay. That's what In fact, we went, when Mayor Higgins was here, we went to voice over IP distribution. And I remember Council um, Raymond Labarge, because he was around, we voted to do that, talking to me a lot about that as, as to the advantage of it. But back then, we were Verizon Centrex, and we had basically every phone in the city had its own phone line mm -hmm. back then. And we reduced it to 153 lines from them. And we do voice over IP distribution over, over the Comcast loop. But we still have to get the phone lines into the system somewhere, and that's where the 153 lines come from. I don't, I know I've recently redone the phone system in my office, and I stayed with Verizon because Comcast couldn't deliver the volume of lines I needed. Um, so I still have Verizon. So that's the 153 lines come in to. Uh, MIS and get put on the voice over IP distribution so we reduced the lines by a lot but that was that was a while ago so this is just the 60-month agreement on the specific lines delivered to us we still deliver them like we've had for several years voice over IP this is just the lines coming into you to go into the so we can over IP so we can benefit of the lower cost per yeah. month yes mm -hmm. yeah All I think, I think said, that like, the confusion might be because when we were doing the presentation back then, a few years ago, uh, there was an analogy made between trying to explain what voice over IP is, and I say it's like the people that use Comcast at home, the Comcast phone, but it didn't mean that we were going to use Comcast. It was just an analogy, and I'm thinking that maybe that was, that's the confusion. Well, there was also, if I could just add, there was also another added factor in that Comcast proceeds from Comcast were used to pay for the system because as part of our contract with Comcast, when we renewed our contract, we agreed to this installation of this INAT system. Is that what mm -hmm. it's uh, called? And so we receive a payment from Comcast, which was to help defray the cost of the new phone system. So Comcast got mixed in there, but just as an example for my office, it used to be that the phone on my office, the phone on Lynn's desk, the phone on Corinne's desk, the phone in Susan's office, all had separate Verizon lines. And we paid a fee for each one of those lines to yeah. each one of those desks. Now there's one line coming to City Hall, and we're using a voice over IP network, and I just plug my jack into the same line I plug my computer into where I get my internet, and, my phone system, and the phone system operates in that iNet that we have. We have two these two interlocking iNets and that the phone system is tied into. So that's where we saw the massive reduction in the number of phone lines, um, yeah. which per, were previously Verizon, which so internally we got rid of Verizon, but as she said, that analogy of you still got to have that send it out into the w wide world, and so Verizon, we need those pipes of Verizon to send it out into the wide world. So, but we can, we didn't come prepared tonight to give you this type of a presentation, but we can certainly get you those numbers. Yeah, cause yeah. Taking all of the uh, all of the credits and the expenses and and uh, and the revenues or whatever it, you, it is, I'd like to see that if we are actually saving the fifty percent that we had told the taxpayers we were going to save. I would like to see that that we're doing it. Vanessa, you you said you. how many? There was six hundred and some odd lines. Over six hundred lines. Yeah. So I think one of the the quickest way to look at the savings is take that hundred and fifty three lines and make it six hundred and something because each phone had its own line with the Centrex system. So you can imagine if 153 became 600 and something, how much that would cost us. So we have recognized considerable savings doing it, um, but I'm sure you could get the specific numbers, but that's, that's a good savings. Yeah, that would just be Verizon. I'm wondering how much Comcast costs us. Just as clarification, the 153 lines are school, city, libraries, everything. So these costs are for everybody. It's not segregated on what the schools pay or what the city pay. Uh, beyond this, the schools get a ERA reimbursement on the copper lines and part of the digital lines. Like I think it's 50 percent. Okay. So, yeah. Councilor Tacey has asked for simple requests rather than go back and forth on this. That if in a future time, he's just saying at some future time, could there be a statement about the savings? So I would like to, I'm not on finance, but if you guys could move your committee meeting along, I think it's a simple <laughs> request to ask. And uh, 
we're discussing this back and forth about what's saved and what isn't, and it can just be, you know, try to be estimated. Councilor Freeman Daniels. I second. <laughs> I'm your emotion, and you're not <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for your um, Thank you. Thank you. I guess we're set with Vanessa. Are we set with? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank I, you. I, I wouldn't mean to put anybody on the spot. I just, I, I, just, I would just like to see, that. And, and I think it does need some discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'll say I'll just say, Councilor, Councilor Tacey, we have a, a power under the charter to um, submit in writing a request for a full accounting of any of any city department or any budgetary concern. So I think I think uh, it's well in our rights to investigate that. But we have to do it in writing. We have to do it in advance. And and uh, I, I'm also interested, as as you are, in seeing these uh, these numbers. So um, following our agenda, we have two financial orders that have been explained to us already, and then the mayor has a presentation he wants to make uh, before the third one. So uh, financial order number one with regards to the Verizon contract. Can I have a motion on that one? I move to uh, recommend. Second. All right, any further discussion on the Verizon contract? And this is to recommend to the full council. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Then uh, a motion on the second financial order to appropriate $112,354 from undesignated fund balance or free cash. That was to populate uh, unemployment, legal, and uh, the city clerk's office for uh, special elections. We have, we have a motion? To recommend. To Move to recommend. Oh, second. We're all in on this one. All right. So it's uh, motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? So now uh, I'd like to recognize the mayor to talk to us about city stat relative to the third financial order. <laughs> so um, I mean, it's your pleasure. If you wanted to forward this out into the full council, I can do it in the full council, but no, I think no, it's the next item in the full council. No, so should, I can. Uh, okay. The rest of the Great. Okay. Speaker. Excellent. So so, okay. So I'm going to uh, make a presentation tonight about the Municipal Performance Management Program and Northampton STAT. And joining me tonight is Elham Sleeman, who's from the uh, Collins Center uh, at the University of Massachusetts at Boston, who we've been working with uh, for the last six months. And so we're going to kind of co-present to you <clears throat> tonight. Um, so if you wanted to just go to the first slide, Mary. Uh, some of you may remember um, uh, in my inauguration, I outlined that I was interested in implementing or piloting a city stat program in the city of Northampton. Um, and the quote is, uh, you know, helping us deliver smarter and more cost-effective services. I'll introduce a program in Northampton for collecting and analyzing data about key city functions and services uh, by collecting and analyzing key data involving city operations and finance on everything from the number of overtime hours logged to the number of potholes filled. I believe we can identify cost savings find more efficient ways of delivering services, and most importantly, provide more information and accountability to the taxpayers. Um, so, uh, and, and we began to, 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 to work on some of these issues early on in my administration, trying to pull data, things we talked about in the parking reorganization, things we've talked about in comp time, things we've talked about um, in our FY13 budget. Go to the, if you can go to the next slide, Mary. But really, performance management, and, and this is sort of what we're what the what city stat is. Performance management is is a systematic approach to trying to look at how can you improve service delivery, how can you use evidence-based, data-driven analysis of the services that you provide to try to increase efficiency and accountability and decision making. Um, so that's sort of what it is in a general sense. You can go to the next slide. So back in the um, back in the mid '90s, uh, interestingly, there was a transit, uh, the New York City Transit uh, Police, and there was an officer in that department who started to tinker around with uh, looking at where crime was occurring in the transit system and began sort of taking maps and putting pins on the maps about where crime was actually happening. And they started developing this system for okay, we should focus our manpower in these areas and, and starting to really look at how they deployed uh, manpower. Um, the, the, the police chief or the chief of that uh, transit division was a guy named William Bratton, um, who then later went on to become the chief of police or the police commissioner in the city of New York under Rudy Giuliani. He took that 
program that had been started in the transit division and, and retooled it for police department in the city of New York. It became known as CompStat. Um, and and in, in the first year of using the system, they saw a crime reduction in New York City of about 60%. Um, you may remember the famous photograph of William Bratton on the cover of Newsweek and said this man reduced crime in, in the city of New York, yada, 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 or something like that. And I think um, Rudy Giuliani dismissed him not long thereafter. He <laughs> ended up working in Boston, but that's a longer story. But, so, but really what they tried to look at was collecting data across all of their precincts and really trying to use that as a way to deploy resources in terms of fighting crime in the city of New York and preventing crimes in the city of New York. Fast forward to the late 90s in Baltimore, um, and there was uh, a situation where the, the, um, the newly elected uh, mayor of, of, um, of Baltimore had just come into office, uh, Martin O'Malley, um, and he inherited a number of major issues with the, the city of Baltimore. High absenteeism rate, uh, you know, poor turnaround on projects, high overtime, a, a number of fiscal challenges. And what Mayor O'Malley did was he essentially adopted the CompStat model and adapted it to uh, his entire city of Baltimore um, and began de using these same techniques, which he called CityStat, uh, to begin really setting up these processes for collecting and analyzing data about how those services were being performed. Um, he was able in, in the first year of implementing this system to, to find about $13 million in savings uh, and, and many subsequent years additional savings. Um, and his program kind of became the mecca for, for this municipal performance management uh, uh, technique. Um, you may now know him as Governor O'Malley. Uh, he went on to become governor, and he's actually promoting performance management across the entire state of, of Maryland. Um, but if you go to the next slide, so, so CityStat began to blossom around the country, um, and particularly even here in Massachusetts, several uh, communities began putting together CityStat programs. You see Somerville, Lowell, Amesbury, Newton, and Woburn um, have, have fully operational city stat programs. I actually spent a lot of time talking to the mayors of Amesbury and Newton um, to talk to them because they have somewhat similar sized communities talking to them about their programs. Um, and, and then other municipalities across New England have also begun adopting it. There's now actually a network called New England StatNet uh, which is actually in part facilitated by the Collins Center, which uh, pulls together all of these interested municipalities about three times a year to do sharing of, of uh, pra best practices and, and sharing of the work that they're doing um, in, in the city stat field. You'll even note that uh, in the last budget uh, uh, this, in the Commonwealth, they've even now worked into uh, the, the state performance management as a way to begin managing at the state level. So it's really taken off. And essentially the way the city stat model works is instead of a, uh, you know, a, a, myself as the mayor meeting with a department and just sort of having, a, you know, kind of a free ranging discussion about what's happening within the department, it's really a structured meeting. And the way the city stat meetings work is it's a, it's a strict one hour meeting. And we come into those meetings. I come in with a team. I've assembled a stat team here in Northampton, which includes uh, Susan Wright. It includes my auditor, the auditor. It includes the finance, uh, it includes the HR director. Um, and, and we meet with the department head and we look at data. And we try to unpack that data and we try to look at what's going on. We ask questions. The data provokes questions. Um, and it really has been a, it's, it's a very useful way of focusing on uh, actually looking at how these services are delivered, looking at issues, looking at funding issues, et cetera, so that we can make management, better management decisions, improve performance, and ultimately provide more cost efficient uh, services to the taxpayers. So, you know, all that was happening. Uh, I've been very interested in doing this. And then along came a grant program that was being offered by the Col Collins Center uh, through the state's uh, Community Innovation Grant Program. Uh, and we applied to that. We applied to be able to participate in this program with the Collins Center to be a pilot study community. Um, <laughs> and so I will then turn it over to Elham to continue the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, everyone, for one of uh, a rather interesting experience today. This, this has probably been the longest 
um, meeting I've attended. So it was uh, thank you for the experience. Very um, <laughs> We're just very great. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so, in a nutshell, the Municipal Performance Management Program, uh, we like to call it the MPMP, we think it sounds a little cooler, um, is a six-month program. I started in Northampton in September. It goes through um, mid-February, so next week. Um, and uh, again, the goals, just as the mayor had stated to reiterate them, of the program itself was to just use data um, to increase awareness of performance management within municipalities. So. I meet with um, the mayor, I meet with uh, Chief uh, Sankowitz, Chief Duggan, um, as well as Ned Huntley, and we have tried to figure out what do you do and how do you do it and how do you do it well and how don't you do it well and how can we improve it. Um, the goals of the MPMP program then are to, okay, so we've identified what you do. Whatever it is that you do well, how can we share it across the communities and the grant? Um, to help them develop common measures, to help them identify best practices. Um, and then in terms of what you don't do well, how can we help you identify the ways that you can do it better? Um, so what was required of the municipalities that joined the grant was to basically hold one hour meetings across each department. So technically three meetings a month. Um, it's been more Easier, easier said than done uh, to hold three meetings a month with different departments, um, and it's and balancing the the needs and the varying needs and interests of everyone. Um, we achieved in holding six meetings thus far. Um, if you can please go to the next slide. So, let's kind of I'll backtrack a little. Um, who am I? I am a recent graduate of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I have a master's in public policy and administration. Um, prior to that, in a different life, I thought that I wanted to pursue a degree in higher ed. Specifically, I thought I wanted to be a stuffy coffee college professor. And I have a master's of arts in applied communication theory. What I realized um, shortly thereafter was that while I could crunch numbers all day, I wound up with a dissertation on how to avoid unwanted relationships in the workplace. So I could tell you how to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> I could tell you how to avoid the people you don't like, <laughs> and do it in a way that they won't tell. But I can't tell you much of anything else. So, I um I was in a little conundrum in that I knew I liked data and I knew I liked um, to tell stories. I always like to tell stories, and I have a background in journalism. So, what next? Well, let's use numbers to tell stories. I pursuit of public policy and administration, and here I am. Um, I graduated in May and stumbled upon one of the best experiences of my life with the Collins Center. Um, I have the pleasure, please move to the next slide, of working with a team of analysts. Um, I'm responsible for Northampton, Chicopee, Orange, and Shirley. Uh, so it is an absolute honor and experience given that I'd never stepped into municipal government except to pay a parking ticket here and there. Um, but it, it's, been a, it's been an absolutely wonderful experience to work in two cities and two towns um, and to see small town politics um, and small city politics. I work with, again, a team of analysts. There are 15 communities, sort of 15 communities in the grant. Um, the other communities under Northampton so you've got Chatham, Medway, Brookline, Holliston, Cambridge, Revere, Salem, Braintree, Andover, New Bedford, and Dartmouth. And if I've mis mis said any of those names, I am not a Massachusetts native. So I've been practicing. Um, the lead municipalities on the grants were Lowell, Amesbury, Somerville, Woburn, and Worcester. I understand it's Worcester. It's Worcester. Worcester. Revere. Revere, Revere, you know, here, Revere. I'm trying here. <laughs> um, so the lead municipalities are the municipalities that uh, came together with the Collins Center and said, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we write for this grant, apply for the CIC grant, make it happen, and then we'll send out the application and see what other communities are interested. And lo and behold, we had, um, we selected 15 for round one. Uh, round two should, should, uh, be commencing in effectively in March 1st. So um, applications are pouring in and hopefully that's going to be that's going to be another interesting experience and an interesting ride. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. So as I said, um, we have done thus far six meetings. 
um, in Northampton. We've, we've dubbed it Northampton stat. Um, I attempted to try to say NoHo stat, and it was shot down immediately. So we've kept it at Northampton stat. Um, the goals of the meetings, again, have been to use data to understand the day-to-day -day functions of departments and to use that data to make, much m make more informed management decisions. Those are the two primary goals. Before I move to the next slide, I just have to do one, one huge disclaimer, and that is if, if you've ever attempted to analyze numbers and created really pretty charts and then sat down and written a paragraph or two about the, about the chart, explaining the chart, um, and then had a discussion about it, it's amazing the kind of aha moments you have when you have that discussion with others. And so the beauty about the STAT model is that for one hour a month, I've been able to meet with the mayor and his STAT team, the chief, um, and they bring to the table their expertise, their knowledge. And so what you're gonna see next aren't necessarily t findings, even though some of them can be seen as findings. I'd like you to look at them as samples or examples of what we've done. Um, they are really portions of the discussion. They're pieces of what we've done. Think of them as kind of suspended parentheticals. So they may not make entirely, they may not make that much sense out of the context of that discussion. If you can please move forward to the next slide. So the first slide here, we see the first three slides are going to be um, for police, for the police department. And again, we proceed with every meeting, every document has data not verified all over it um, because people make mistakes and even the data analyst who just finished telling you that she's got a background in quant will make mistakes. Um, so the slide is showing us overtime spending as a percent of salaries. I wanna point out a couple of things. Um, FY11 and FY12 are actual figures for the police department. They're actually what was spent. FY13 was budgeted figures. Um, this slide was probably from our September meeting. Um, and so what we see, I hope you can all see the, 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 the colors, but I'll just go through them real quick. The um, FY, the yellow bars are the overtime figures. The dark blue bars are the, um, the actual salaries. And then what I wanna direct everyone's attention to is that reddish, that red fuzzy line or orange line if you're standing from where I'm standing. Um, and so what that kind of says is in FY11 and in FY12, overtime was spent consistently at approximately 7.4% as a percent of their salaries in the police department. In FY13, we noticed that the overtime as a percent of the salary is budgeted to be approximately 5%. So, sitting in a room with Chief Sankowitz, I looked at him and said, how in the world are you supposed to tell me that you're going to maintain overtime at 5% of your salaries? It's absolutely incredulous. And even further, how did you do at 7.4%? What is it that you do? Please tell us because this is clearly best practices. And he proceeded to explain their mechanisms that they have in place to check for overtime. Overtime is approved judiciously in the police department. You don't just rant, you just, you cannot just walk in and say, I need overtime for X, Y, and Z. Overtime is checked at least two times by the commanding, shift commanding officer and then his or her superior. Um, on, on top of that, supervisors are also charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the work is completed in the time and the shift that it needs to be completed. So you don't have the, 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 the example that we all think of, which is I'm going to go in the cruiser and I have all these reports to write, and so I'm going to wait until I get back to the station, and then I'm going to dilly-dally, and I'm going to type, and then all of a sudden, oh, chief, I need overtime because I didn't finish the reports. No, that doesn't happen. The reports need to, need to get done in the cruiser. And if you can't get them done in the cruiser right away, then when you get back to the station, you need to get them done. On top of that, they manage vacation time. Well, so then how do you manage vacation time? Well, vacation time is done um, on bid. It's, again, done in a very strategic way. Um, it's absolutely fascinating how they manage vacation at the police department. And it's managed in a way 
that it doesn't it minimizes or maintains overtime that's what i will say so for instance if an individual chooses to take a vacate applies or bids for the vacation and it just so happens that that individual needs to attend court training or court or training they figure they have the mechanisms in place to switch the vacation so that they are not being called back in and then the city is incurring paying overtime for that individual. Um, none of this information would have ever been evident from just looking at this slide. And it's that I, I'm gonna keep drilling, you're gonna, you're gonna get sick of hearing me say how important it is to actually be able to hear the entire discussion. So um, I will also say that we did, I did take this slide and I showed it to every one of my communities and all my other peers and said, look at how awesome Northampton is. So Northampton PD is absolutely fantastic in, in, in with this, res this regard. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a slide where um, for anonymity's sake, I went ahead and just put municipalities. I kept Northampton on there so that you all could see where Northampton stands. Um, but this captures the per capita warning traffic citations as well as payable citations issued in CY11. Um, this data is representative of one of the many ways we look at comparables in the program. And so we've looked at comparables in terms of how you compare in terms of your activity. We've looked at it in terms, as you'll see later, how do you compare in terms of your staffing, um, in terms of overtime, um, in terms of fleet, that sort of thing. Um, but this one in particular was interesting because again, you know, the data suggests that Northampton is evenly distributed in terms of the warning and payable citations. So um, it allowed us to discuss in a meeting the types of tech tactics strategically that, that are employed, that are, that the police department has and the, their belief on traffic enforcement. Um, but then it also, Again, you look and you go, you, you think to yourself, what on earth is happening with municipality one? And why are they neither enforcing warning or payable citations? And again, this is one of those slides that beckons a further discussion. And the answer for municipality one was that they actually had um, a series of requirements that they were making the police, I'm sorry, go ahead, counselor. What's the Y axis there? The municipalities. No, that's. I mean, what's the what's going ver vertically, zero through thirty, thirty one. I'm sorry, per capita um, citations, oh, and yeah. the municipalities are. Yes, I'm sorry, you can't read that. No, I just. That's I, I understand that. It's, okay. So it's. Sorry. That's my question too. Oh, <laughs> please feel free to go ahead, ma'am. Well, one other question, and actually, it just refers back to the previous slide about sure. the time, and you don't need to go back, but. Um, I guess my question is, um, public safety departments, police, fire are 24-7. Yes. So, and they're, you know, they have three shifts typically. So comparing that to something that would ordinarily just be a, a one-shift operation, it seems like it would be less likely to, to incur overtime generally just because those shifts are already covered. Correct. So are you measuring that against those departments? We would only compare against comparable departments. Okay. Um, and that was actually, it, 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 later on we, I learned rather quickly when I came in and sh um, showed in a Northampton staff f f meeting for, with fire, all the municipalities from tiny little Shirley all the way up to Worcester and compared their fire departments. And it was quickly evident that you can't compare fire departments just across the board. You have to look at the different variables that come into play. So no, so in in this, it's just police departments that we're looking. When we've compared okay. over time, it's specific to that. So we're just comparing with other municipalities, same departments? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you can move to the next slide. This is probably one of my favorite slides, and I understand at face value it looks very boring and it doesn't make any sense. So the I'm again, my labels aren't on there, and I'm sorry about that. Um, on the y-axis, we have the number of calls. Um, the uh, x-axis shows the hour, so it's in military time. Zero to three is midnight to three a.m., so on and so forth. 
So what um, what was interesting about the slide and what I like about the slide is when I when I did the slide and I put it on the screen, Chief Sanko scratch, scratched his head and said, "This is wrong. This makes no sense. Why on earth do we have that many calls between zero and you know midnight and three a.m.?" And one would naturally jump to the conclusion and say, "Well, you have more crimes midnight to three a.m." People are, you know, the bars are closing. Maybe that's what it is. That's a, that's a, that's an educated guess. And he, the longer he stared at it, he had again the takeaway mo moment, the aha moment, which was, no, actually, what's happening is a new policy was implemented that between midnight and 3 a.m. they need the police officers need to actually self-initiate and call into the police station and say, I just did a building check, and the building is safe. It's all clear. I'm moving on to my next building. That's the spike that you see. Oh. Okay. So again, it's one of those at face value. It's a very plain chart, but I simply like it because it makes sense. Um, and I also got to say that I was right and he was wrong, <laughs> <laughs> which you don't get get to do with Chief Sankowitz very much. So, um, can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So here is um, the fire some of the, the ways that we've looked at fire. And so what's interesting is that we've tried to look at internal. So for police, we tried to look across police stations, um, across municipalities, identifying areas that the municipalities are struggling in, and then going back to the Ch Chief Sankowitz and saying, Chief, how do you do it? What can I tell municipality one, two, and three? Um, for fire, it's been, let's look at ourselves and look at how, how we're doing and compare. Um, what you're looking at is EMS and fire calls per group. I have one big disclaimer to make, and that is what you're looking at is for a one month period. It's not, we learned rather quickly that you can't really look at one month periods for internal comparisons. And the reason for that is that the groups in fire actually work different days. So in this month in particular, um, group A and B worked seven days and grouped, groups C and D worked eight days. So some of the variance is going to be due to the fact that one group, one set of groups worked more, more days than the other. Um, the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just the EMS fire difference. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you want to talk? No, no, it's okay. I just, well, I mean, again, these, you know, what this slide also points out, which is interesting, is the breakdown between the number of EMS calls versus fire calls. Yes. And you can see the largest volume of the calls that the fire department deals with are EMS calls. So mm -hmm. the calls are broken down that way as well. So right. it's mm -hmm. just, that's another wrinkle to that yeah. slide. Thank you. And, and again, to add to the wrinkle, I'm, I probably should be looking at my notes and then I'll remember everything as opposed to having the mayor jump in and rescue me, right? Um, I'm going to use that lifeline when they start asking okay. questions. Um, <laughs> the, what, what really, what the, the emphasis here, what it points out to is the F Northampton fire is experiencing the same thing as all other fire departments across the, the U.S. And, uh, and that is, there's a the trend is moving towards EMS and not fire calls. So it's okay now that that's that we know that that's the trend. What do we do? And so this is this is was one of many kind of questions of okay. So what have you done? Um, if you will move to the next slide, please. This is another way. Earlier I had prefaced the municipality one, two, and three data with um, saying how we looked at municipality com comparables. Well, this was. Um, looking at external comparisons of command structures of, of comparable fire departments. And again, you know, while you take all ratios and averages with grains of salt, what, what made this even more difficult is while you can identify municipalities that will share the same kind of sociodemographics. Um, you know, we'll have the existence of well, the fire department itself will be ALS, BLS. Um, will the fire department will be in a proximity to a hospital or to a park? Um, you still can't capture it all. And the reason for that is what one municipality will call a deputy chief, another municipality is calling a lieutenant. So 
even when trying to parse it down and say, okay, I finally have my four municipalities that look, or excuse me, my three municipalities that look exactly like Northampton. Um, you really don't because even in getting them down to looking just like Northampton's fire department, the way their command structures were, they don't necessarily, they don't all exactly equal out to what North, the way Northampton has the ranks listed. So it's a lot of interpretation is what I'm saying. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the final slide uh, we, I chose to show was um, the DPW uh, completed versus not completed work orders. This is from 2010 through 2000, January 2010 through January 2011. Um, I chose to do percent completed versus percent not completed. If you can't see it from the back, what the lighter bars are the not completed and the darker bars are the completed work orders. Mm -hmm. um, so this slide served a major purpose in that it helped us to identify the the weakness of the DPW's work order system. Um, we were able to see that you know the, it's limited in the capacity to provide us with information. What the DPW uses and what you're looking at is um, information that I pulled from an access database. So we don't there is a high probability, a high likelihood, and I will emphasize the data not verified, that some of these, um, and I, I, I should back up and say that this is for the streets division, um, but there is a high probability that some of these bars represent um, duplicates, uh, that some of these bar, some of the non-completed work orders are work orders that were completed but just weren't checked off. So really there's, this probably is one of the one slide I'd point to and say is not the most accurate. Um, and it is in part due to the fact that there isn't a work order system that can give us the information. They don't have a work order system implemented that can give us the information that we need, which is what's your turnaround time? What's your percent completed? How much did it cost you to fill that pos pothole? That sort of thing. That's the information we'd be looking for. Counselor Sarah, thank Can you. I just have a question? Sure. It just struck me when I looked at the mosquito 100% complete. Do Correct. Do do that anymore? Yes. You do? Yeah. Donuts mostly, right? Not not as much spraying as we used to. I thought we didn't we had, had we didn't fund it at all, did we? Uh, there uh, there there is the the bio donut that do get put out at certain times during the year. Um, and again, I want to be careful that we don't actually to don't turn this into it. a city stat meeting because yeah. we don't have the department represented, et cetera. But this is one of the that they have work orders on. And so I believe they still have a person who goes out on calls to deal with high mosquitoes. Oh, okay. I said no. I, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can I ask a question about uh, the new app that uh, yes. we've employed that actually comes with a work order list mm -hmm. or a work order structure that in fact actually is particularly fashioned almost specifically for DPW call response yes. things. Um, has that been considered for implementation into, into DPW? Um, so, uh, well, so obviously DPW is using the new we're using the new app, piloting the new app in some way with DPW. I mean, one of the things that came out of our work, particularly, so so police and fire have a pretty robust data collection system that they, that's the ICM uh, system. IMC. IMC, sorry. IMC. Incident Management Command or something like that. I think so, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, and so, um, and so they have this really robust system that has all this data in it. And so the trick for there was trying to figure out how do we actually extract, get, extract yeah. that data. In the case of the DPW, what we found was that we need to really help them to build up their capacity to be able to create this kind of data and to automate things like work order systems, et cetera. And that, and that's going to be, that's one of the things that we've, I've taken away from that and that we were going to really try to work on in the next phase of this is to work on that system. They have a, they have a program that we're going to try to work with them to fully implement uh, that will have integration capabilities with the app program. But that's, I mean, 
So one of the challenges that you find is that, is there actually data that you can collect? So that, that's part of the struggle in some departments is how do we collect the data? So um, one, one problem, one challenge is parsing the um, enormous amount of data that you have Correct. in some departments with, with systems that, that facilitate that. And then the other challenge is departments that may not be as advanced Absolutely. Uh, in, in, in their ability to collect. And, and Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so th that concludes my portion of the slides. I do just want to take one quick second. Thank you all for having me. Um, but I also want to thank Chief Sankowitz, Chief Duggan, as well as Ned Huntley for their support, their openness, their transparency, um, and their just will their cooperation and putting up with the amount of email requests and data requests for giving them to me. Um, but Mayor Narkowitz has a few closing remarks that he'd like to. Um, yes. Um, so again, and I want to thank um, Ilham because one of the things that the cities that have fully functioning city stat programs and the challenge for a city like ours that's trying to start something like this is, you know, you go to Newton or you go to Somerville, they have a city stat office. I mean, they have a summer stat office in Somerville that's got two or three analysts and this is what they do all day long mm -hmm. and, and, and they just have a much larger capacity to do that. So one of the great things about the grant program was it gave us an analyst. It gave us that, that analyst capacity. It also um, allowed us to plug into this larger network that the state had set up of these analysts across the state and sister communities and the StatNet program and, and all those kinds of things. So, um, and that's really what, I mean, we, we were trying to play with data and begin to work with data, but to really have somebody who that was their focus to be able to really help guide us through the process uh, was invaluable. Um, and again, that was a competitive grant that we won. So just quickly, some of the lessons we learned in the first, in, the, in this very short six month grant was again, looking at trends across different departments, identifying things uh, that, you know, one department may be doing and how can we carry over those lessons in other departments, looking at use of overtime benefits, those kinds of things. Um, that I mentioned the interdepartmental best practices and how we can migrate those practices to other departments. Um, looking at day-to-day -day functions of departments, and I have to, what you saw tonight were just like a, just the briefest little snapshot of how these city stats work because it's a very intensive, um, and we, we have, you know, 30, 40 slides and we spend a lot of time, and then those slides create other slides that like, what did we learn? And we need to get a slide to figure out what that meant um, so we can continue to drill down. But the, the, the whole point of it is, at the end of the day, we can start to figure out, okay, why is, why is X expense so high in this particular month or in this particular area or what's causing that and how can we remedy that or why are we falling short in delivering this service and how can we improve that? That's the ultimate goal. Um, and, you know, what they learned in New York City and what they've learned in Baltimore and other places is you can actually use the data to make those kinds of decisions about how you manage, make these management uh, decisions. So. Um, the, the StatNet conferences have been invaluable. Again, being able to go to a larger group and compare the stuff we're doing. And I'll point out, when I went to the, um, and again, this is, I mean, the Northampton Police Department has been using these, I mean, I think that's one of the things that you quickly realize is that they actually have been using CompStat very effectively and aggressively. It's ingrained in what they do at the Northampton Police Department. They are routinely looking at crime numbers and where they're occurring and you know what intersections are having accidents and trying to deploy staffing. So they've, they've been doing that work. I sat in, uh, when we did the opening kickoff session for this uh, grant program at the Kennedy Center, they did kind of a, they did a mock city stat with the mayor of Somerville and his police chief and their city stat team, and they kind of did it in front of us, uh, kind of let us into what one of their city stats looked at. And they looked at a bunch of the stuff they were doing in Somerville. They also looked at comparison communities. And Northampton actually came up in some of those comparison charts because we had been doing, we were doing things that uh, they hadn't done. So for example, all the other communities, we were the outlier in that we had civilianized the court officer position, which in most other communities is a sworn police officer that does that court duty. We civilianized the position, which has resulted in, you know, making sure we have more sworn officers out on the streets doing police work as opposed to the administrative tasks of the court officer. Um, so in some cases we're identifying where we're, where we're doing well, in other cases we're finding where we can uh, you know, find room for improvement. So 
part of what they're doing now is they're moving into the second phase of the program. And so in order to continue in the program, which we have expressed an interest in doing, in order to maintain the analyst position, uh, we now, the, they've created a fee structure that we will pay, enter into an agreement with the Collins Center to be part of this network of communities going forward. Uh, to be able to continue and to have the services of a, of a dedicated analyst for another year so hopefully we can fully develop the program. So part of what the order that you have before you tonight is a transfer from this line item for PNS into contractual services that will allow us to continue. I would like to continue the program. I think it has incredible value. I think you're going to start to see some of the results of it. Uh, as we bring forth budgets that reflect some of the performance management items that we've identified. So, uh, Mr. F uh, Freeman Daniels, I know you had a question. Actually, that was, the, you almost answered it. Um, this 20,000 buys a, a year of this? Almost, a, almost another year, yes. Uh, almost another year of, uh, of this work. And again, uh, it's, uh, we're not only getting the work of the analyst who will be with us, but also, uh, um, access into all the other network and the other uh, resources that the Collins Center provides to all the sister communities. And again, if I if you know, for us to do this staff program on our own, we'd have to figure out a way to hire a staff person to do this, or or reallocate someone to do this particular staff this work. Um, and so that's why I'm asking for the opportunity to use some of this excess funding in our office to continue in the program for another year. Any more questions in finance? Yeah. I'm sorry, can I just follow? So I guess my, my question then is, is this, so, so it seems as though the first six months was um, a uh, fact-finding adventure. Am I right? Any oh, that? Yeah. Well, w it was a very structured program that the Collins Center had put together. So all of the communities um, that participated had to start with their police department. It was boilerplate. Then, so we had to, then we moved on to DPW. We actually did kind of push it a little bit and, and branched out into fire, which wasn't really part of the uh, curriculum, but we did that anyway. Um, and and um, so it was a little bit of a, of a basic overview just to kind of get the thing off the ground, to start having some city staff meetings. So to accelerate it. What's that? You accelerated. We accelerated. All right, so that's yeah. good. That's Northampton. Yes. Yeah. But um, the question is, what happens? What's the next year look like? Is it, is it a similar, uh, regimented program from the Collins Center, or is it uh, more according to your priorities? I and think we have the, we have a, we have now more flexibility to be able to then focus on. Uh, to build on what we've learned and to focus in on. And I'll say, for example, you know, the fire, the police department is not an area that I'm going to exert a lot of work because I feel like they're, we have already quickly learned they're already using staff internally. And so we'll be able to do check-ins with them about that. Where, where my focus is probably going to be turning is the DPW issue and really trying to work with them and, and having someone who can help them work with the data collection uh, system and get it up and running and get it robust so we can start to collect more data. And then obviously continuing the work we're doing in FIRE. And then what I also want to do is look at some kind of citywide uh, data issues that are not necessarily departmental, but looking um, at some citywide uh, issues as well, similar to what we did when we looked at comp time across all city departments, uh, things like that. So. Sure. Sure. Uh, one more question. This I haven't heard anything about the school system. Is that just different? Not about the, the school system. The schools are they? Yeah, it hasn't them? really moved. And I mean, there has been some performance management work done in the schools, but right now it's not focused on the schools. I think that would be. And it won't be for the. For not the for this. No, I, I don't. Well, obviously, I don't have the authority over the schools to to do that but I mean certainly as the pro if the program were to evolve it's something that could be talked about but for right now it's just city based my looking at my the, the agencies that I oversee thank you yeah also LeVar you had a question yes thank you um, mayor I want to thank you very much I, I think we really do need to go in this direction um, I want to thank <coughs> Elhan also for being here and doing the presentation with our mayor and I'm going to support this 100% because I like what I saw. I also feel at this $20,000,
we're looking at departments that I have great concerns about, and it's time to move ahead. So I'm going to support this. Thank you, Councilor. I, I, I do believe it will be a very good investment in terms of the work that we're going to be doing over the next year and, 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 and actually in some ways helping to support our departments to improve and to, and to share practices that they've developed with other departments. So I think there's definitely, and, and learning from other cities as well. Uh, thank you both, Alham. Did, did you? I, no, I'm. Okay, I thought I wasn't. The, I, 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 the, the, um, actually, it's clear that this is one of, the, one of the strengths of this type of data analysis. It kind of takes the entrenched cultural resistance to some type of implementation. It, 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 it at least takes the element, some of the emotional elements out of it and makes and perhaps would hopefully facilitate. Uh, transition to these systems, particularly the fact that we have an example in the community to, to point to to show efficacy of, of, of this project. I'm, I actually, I, I'm going to join everyone else in appreciating that this is moving this way. I think that this, uh, but I, I think to that point, one of the obvious problems when we present data or discuss data or analyze data is is the clash cultural clash that occurs consequently because there's cultures in each one of these systems and trying to implement these policies <coughs> against policies that have evolved over time out of necessity as opposed to without without much forethought maybe necessarily applied that might not be the most efficient uh, consequently there are people who feel poorly used by decisions rendered from these things. But I think I like the approach that you're taking here because I think that this is sort of softening the ground for the conversations as we proceed. And, it, and I think that at least I certainly feel, and it seems I'm hearing it reflected here in the council, that we like that these initial steps and these initial forays are going to um, reap benefits that not only fiscal benefits, which are clearly obviously important, but the, it seems to have, uh, as you said, applications beyond that, uh, the applications that actually have genuine, genuine service benefits to the community and the community at large. They do, and then, and then harking back to my original quote in my inauguration, and then the ultimate, once we can get it fully, get something <coughs> fully up and, 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 and running, if you look at some of the more developed communities, we then can start to put these metrics out to the public so we can start to provide kind of a report card on how we're doing. You go to Newton and look at their website across departments and you'll see they have uh, their city stat or Newton stat produces sort of report cards for departments or, or info for residents so they can see what the call response times were, what the, you know, what the trash pickup, uh, you know, times were, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Um, and so we can actually start to tell a story, as, as Halam said, about the services we're providing and how we're doing it uh, efficiently. Well, so. and obviously the transparency in itself yeah. is, is, well, well, good on you. Thank you. Okay. And, and I have to point out her button, I love municipal data. So uh, well, she's, a, she's a, there are a lot of those. She's a fellow, uh, <laughs> a fellow wonk. So it's, uh, well, I'm it's a lot of a thousand or something. Yes. Is <laughs> Actually, my supervisor has a specialty in making buttons, so I'm taking oh. orders. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <You know. laughs> well, we have two more pages of fine municipal Thank you. process. You're welcome to share with us if you around. <laughs> so uh, in finance, then, yeah. So the parking tickets you alluded to, you didn't get them in Northampton, did you? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are one of the most efficient uh, services and, and departments ever, so go parking services. There you go. <laughs> and, you know, I, we get, I get a lot of emails from Edward the Collins. I'm sure everybody else in the council gets them. So are you set for it's just like reading that your button. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, when I, when I, the first ticket that I got, I had to say that the, the immediate response to the mayor was, well, at least we know they're trending positively in revenue. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have a motion on our third financial order, which is a budgetary transfer um, from the personnel side to the <laughs> OM twenty thousand for this? All right. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? No. All in favor of finance? Aye. Aye. All right. Do we have anything unanticipated? No, I certainly don't. Move to adjourn finance. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Here we go, just just at a glacial clip here. We are moving through 
Um, uh, moving through the agenda. The this is the reports on committee. Um, we take as a group. Motion Second. Take the minutes as a group. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. Move to accept minutes. And is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now we move on to um, street acceptance. Move to refer as a group. Second. Second it. Any discussion? Refer to planning and to board public works. The motion is to, move to refer to planning and public works. Uh, is there a second? Aye. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all very much. Uh, we don't have the presentation anymore because we just had it. Unless you'd like to do it again. No, thank you. <laughs> all right. This is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. Uh, whereas Chapter 30B of Massachusetts General Law requires City Council approval for contract terms exceeding three years, and whereas Massachusetts Contract IT and T ITT 46 provides for periods up to 60 months, and whereas a five-year agreement with Verizon offers the lowest monthly cost per telephone lines, and whereas uh, MA ITT 46, the City will not incur penalties if this agreement is rescinded before 60 months. Therefore, be it ordered, the City of Northampton is authorized to enter into telephone Centrex and PRI line service agreement with Verizon for a period not to exceed five years as specified in MA ITT 46 network services. Move to approve. Is a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Move to suspend rules for second reading. Second. Uh, all those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Move second reading. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Aye. This is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. Ordered that $112,354 be appropriated from the FY13 general fund undesignated fund balance, otherwise known as free cash, to the following accounts. $50,000. Uh, the account is 11-512-53-002, which is Legal Services OM. $40,000, the account number is 19-131-519-300 to the Unemployment PS. $6,716, the account number is 11-611-513,000, that's the City Clerk Overtime PS. $2,638. The account number is 11-612-55-8017. That's for the City <coughs> Clerk Election Supplies OM. $13,000 to account 11-612-53-108. That's City Clerk Election Workers OM. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Those in favor? Aye. 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 Suspend Rule 14. Second reading. Second there's, reading. There's a move to suspend rules. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Is there a motion for the second reading? Move to approve. And second. seconded by Councilor Tacey. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. On the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, ordered that the following FY 2013 budgetary transfers be and hereby are made. Uh, the department, the mayor's department, PS, salaries permanent, uh, uh, $20,000, and that is to be transferred to uh, the mayor OM and also the mayor OM contractual services transferred to $20,000. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? It's a late, late file. Does he want a second reading? Is this a late file? No. Oh, no. Does he want a second reading? You want two readings? It's just moving money from within an existing budget. If you would do that, that would be great because it would allow us to work. Two readings. On track. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, well, let's like let's do the first reading. Let's do the first reading. All those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Suspend rule 14. Second reading. Second. Uh, all all those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Motion for the second reading. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Thanks for sticking around, Susan. 
<laughs> Sheesh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this one? Okay. No, I didn't either. The amendment. Right, okay. This is the amended version. Uh, this will require consideration of an amendment. Um, this is uh, on the recommendation of the Board of Public Works uh, and Tree Committee. This is the this is second reading, right? Yes. The amendment yes. second reading. Um, and do you want me to forego reading? No. Yes, please. What's the amendment? <laughs> okay. Full reading. Uh, the amendment proposed is uh, on your amended version, whereas the Board of Public Works will require each person entering city property to plant trees to sign a release of liability uh, substantiated as attached. That's what, you, that's what you asked, right? Is, is there a motion for the amendment? So moved. Yeah. Second. 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 All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Okay, now we move on to, I'll accept a motion. 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 Second reading. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It is passed in second reading with as amended. Councilor, yes, Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. President, uh, can I just go back to that financial order, that 112-354? I'm sorry. The 112-54 from FY uh, 2013? Yeah. The general fund undes undesignated fund balance. Um, you know what? The, the uh, finance director's not here, so uh, forget it. Is uh, it something you could handle with a memo? Or? I will. I'll try. I'll try. It's just clarification. Someone's phone is on. Um, it's the, it's the, uh, this is the order here for, this is upon the recommendation of uh, Dwight. This is an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended by revising Section 224 of said code, providing that the uh, Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in City Council assembled as follows. And there's a recommendation for an amendment here. Um, be it ordained. Uh, where was I? <laughs> uh, ba, ba, ba. Be amended by. Uh, be ordained the City Council, blah, 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 as follows. Thank you. There we go. Um, Section 224, Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use, Amend 22-4B, Membership, uh, Strike 6, the five members, and replace the five members shall consist of four city councilors and strike the mayor and designee of the mayor. Councilor Adams. I have a question. Sure. Where did the amendment come from? Separate from city council. So did 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 he give a memorandum or anything to that effect? Uh, the, we, the, the mayor is mayor. still recognized, so the mayor is welcome. Yeah, to. I, I um I hope that we get um and some kind of a memorandum to you in time for tonight. But the the basic concern that I expressed and that he expressed was that um, if our goal is to separate the executive from the legislative body having the executive appointing people to a legislative committee just didn't seem to comport with that separation um, any more than if I were starting to appoint people to the public safety committee or appointing people to your commi other committees it just and so um, I know that and actually in fairness that's language that was already that's been in the ordinance um, it, when that Edlu committee was created and the mayor used to serve as the chair but to my knowledge mayor Higgins never actually appointed an extra person as her designee to serve on that committee. She never did. And because I remember when I was council president trying to figure out that committee, that was always a vacant spot. Um, and, and I didn't appoint anybody when I was became mayor um, to it. And I just, again, I believe that like other council committees, staff, you know, myself and my departments will come to the committees and be a resource and present information. But 
actually having them serve as a voting member on the committee, I think go, crosses that line between having the separation between the executive and the legislature. So, and, and I apologize, this one we didn't, I didn't see because it, it was a late, you guys late, it got late filed and referred, and so I never actually, so I, I didn't really see it till it came out of ordinance. Um, so that's why we had reached out beforehand. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, um, I concur uh, with the mayor on this. Um, even though I, when I wrote it, it, I had, I included, and when we wrote it, I, we included the designee of the mayor. Um, the, a more thorough, we're, we're hitting this issue actually um, now a little bit more than um, we had been in previous, in the, last month, <laughs> uh, that we hit it last month, uh, which, was, uh, which was, or the month before, which really the, the actually three months since the charter has been passed. And, it's becoming clear to me that, uh, or even more clear, and I think even more clear to Solicitor Seawald that uh, any, any committee that is not composed of members of the council is a multiple member body and not subject, and, and, and therefore not subject to a, a vote, vote, of the council, vote, of, vote of the council without the mayor's introduction of, a, of an administrative order. Uh, and, and that's actually going to affect some of the other issues as well. But on this particular one, uh, I, I concur that I think this is, um, this is a, the proper way to go. I'd also like to add that I don't believe that any council committee should be in the city's ordinances and that they should be established by council rule. But uh, since we have them right now and because we have the ordinance, uh, I think we should stick with this and just make it a four member city council committee they are exempt from my you know they're specifically exempted from me having any approval authority or or you know specifically council committees I'm, are exempt from any oversight by me. so that would make sense that you would they don't have to be in the ordinances per se yeah council Adams. thank you it could certainly make sense that the mayor shouldn't appoint um designees to council committees but what I'm curious about is if, um, and if obviously this doesn't have to be done tonight, but I'm curious if there's actually any authority that states that, that specifically. Um, well, I can, I mean, again, I would get back to the, the sort of bedrock first section of the charter. The mayor shall not exercise any legislative power and vice versa. So how my appointing someone to a, legislative committee I think to me that would be a clear exercise I'd be exercising legislative power by putting someone who's my designee sitting as a voting member of a legislative committee I just th I just think that that's you know I, I think that goes against the the charter so I think if you take me off the committee you really have to take me and my designee off the committee uh, to really to, to create that separation that we're hoping for and again uh, you know just like with any other of your council committees uh, you know, economic development person, planning director. I mean, I, you know, it would be, um, it just would not make sense that I would appoint Wayne Fiden to the Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use Committee as a voting member. It just, who, you know, it just wouldn't make sense to have an administrative, administration official sitting on your committee as a voting member. So that's all. So, so again, it was, I'm not quite sure. I think when th that rule was created, it was because the committee was blended. And it was, you know, a blended city council mayor committee, so it was like four two. Well, and, and um, the distinctions were not as clear as they were exactly. In the charter. Yeah. And and actually, also as a point of information, this is first reading, and it can be amended in second reading yeah. as well. But uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels, where was where was commission? Where was the solicitor on this? I mean, wasn't the solicitor at the ordinance committee meeting when this was reviewed? He wasn't actually. Uh, he he wasn't at that particular meeting. Yeah. Um, uh, that 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 was that, that came forward. So did did he notify either of the sponsors about this? No. Um, I heard from the mayor, but uh, about this concern relative to this, and, and I think I think he well. What happened was when we go through the process of the solicitor reviews all the ordinances to sign them. This was one that he flagged, right. and I think he sent an email to you about it or to Mary about it. So I'm sorry for the late timing of it. Again, it was one that we it. It kind of came in as a late file and then went out the door to committees and it was never 
never showed up on the agenda because it was a late file. I think, so. I think to some degree this is on me, and we would probably benefit from a stat review as well uh, on how we conduct <laughs> council business and how we transfer the issue of the charter just so that we can do this with uh, a little more efficiency. And, and uh, so I'll own this one. And uh, but it, it, if we have a committee, if we have the ordinance committee, and this is ordinance, you know, when we have the solicitor there at the ordinance, we should have that should be where this is vetted. Yeah. Well, it's 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 clearly essentially an oversight, but that's been caught, and and, and it doesn't it doesn't obviate the the point. So, um, how what's your what's your preference here? How do you want? I move to I move to amend. Second. Okay. There's a motion to amend, uh, and that is striking the mayor and designee of the mayor from this ordinance. Move to approve. Uh, uh, it's, it's already moved. Is, is yeah. any discussion? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Now uh, let's. Uh, that's that's the amendment, and so I'll move the ordinance as amended. Second. 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 Okay. Any discussion? I'd just like to say thank you to the sponsors and, and the drafter. Thank you. I, I, you know, this is this is uh, Council Freeman Daniels Bailiwick, and and we are well served by his attention to these details. I have to say, I just sign my name on it and take the blame when it's screwed up. So, oh. <laughs> I so do that either. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed and abstentions. Thank you all very much. You want to do two readings of that so we can j actually. I'm just going to ask. Meeting. Rule no. 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 <clears throat> Oh, all right. There's no second. Take a rule. No second. No, no second. Okay. Do would you like a formal memo from uh, the city solicitor? So I think that's that gives us the, the two reading the period within two readings. He doesn't have to write a memo. Maybe an email or, or something or show up at the come to the next meeting or something like that. I apologize. I didn't mean to throw that no out there like that. No, that's okay. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We're all friends. Uh. All right, and this is upon the recommendation of Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels and Councilor William H. Dwight, uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the uh, that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 228 of said code, providing that finance can be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton. And the City Council assembled as follows: that Section 228 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended. So that such section shall read as follows. Section 22.8, Finance Committee, amend. 22-8B, membership. Membership shall consist of uh, I gotta, uh, four city councilors, period. Uh, we will be striking the mayor, the president of the city council, and three to be appointed by the city of uh, the city council. The mayor shall serve as the chairperson of the Finance Committee ex officio. Move first reading. Second. Any discussion? Council Freeman Daniels. Uh, again, this is just to reflect the, what we've pretty much put in practice, and I reiterate that I still do not believe that council committees should be uh, in the city's ordinance. Duly noted. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any? Okay. Move, I'd like to move to suspend rules for a second reading. There's a suspension of rules? Second. Proposed. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Uh, I'll entertain uh, another motion. Move to approve. Second. Second it. All those in up. Oh, Council Freeman. Uh, we don't have a real, we don't have a similar solicitor problem with this one. Uh, we're doing it now. I see. I say, why not bring ourselves into compliance since there hasn't really been any significant objection? Good point. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. This is uh, upon the recommendation of Councilor Paul D. Spector, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 312 117 of said code, providing that Schedule, what's that, Schedule 16 on uh, on street and off street handicapped parking spaces be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton, the City Council assembled as follows. That Section 312.117 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton be amended so that he, uh, such section shall read as follows. Add uh, Henshaw Avenue, Easterly, 
the first parking space 72 feet south of the intersection of Henshaw Avenue and Crescent. Second it. Okay. Is it uh, Councilor Freeman? No, that, yeah, that's my okay. Councilor Specter, you want to come um, Yeah, actually, this was a request from um, residents in my ward uh, to have a handicapped space uh, put in at this location that would really help them, especially during the winter months. And I want to thank the, the uh, Council on Disabilities, Committee on Disabilities, for their help in this, because it's always a question of do you honor uh, one person asking for this request, because we don't want there to be a flood of requests. But I think in this particular case, and we haven't been flooded in the past, if we are in the future, we can deal with that. And I appreciate your looking into this and doing it thoroughly and really examining the situation. I know that a few of you even went to the spot and that uh, Patty Shaughnessy actually spoke to the people, and I appreciate the help and the, th and the thoroughness with which you did this. So this is really helping two elderly residents there make it through the winter in a way that's safe for them so they can actually get down to their vehicle and not be trapped uh, when, when it's icy. Because the street actually where it is on, on this area of Crescent Street gets extremely icy and it's very difficult for them to go down and unless they have a parking space right near there <coughs> it's been tough in the past winters <coughs> Did you have a question? Uh, Council? thank you um, the committee on disabilities Pat Shaughnessy made a trip over I as the consular of being the liaison also went over there the elderly people do understand that it is a city street, that sign would be used for anybody who is handicapped. But they're very, very pleased that the consular on that ward has really looked at that very seriously, and that sign definitely needs to be placed there to help and accommodate that elderly family. So without no problem and with a great recommendation from the Committee on Disabilities, they all agreed that that sign should be placed there. Councilor Freeman Daniels, did you have a question? Uh, I just, yeah, thank you. Um, I believe that uh, the um, there's a companion ordinance here that we might want to just pass at the same time. Is that the you want to consider that? Yes, yes. Consider yes. That suggestion. Yep. They do. They rhyme, yeah. and in fact, one informs the other. So I will quickly read that ordinance as well upon the recommendation of uh, Councilor Specter. An ordinance of the city of Northampton uh, providing the code of ordinances of the city of Northampton be amended by revising section 312 of said order providing no parking at certain times and that's now establishing a tollway zone for Henshaw Avenue uh, on the easterly side from 1201 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, uh, point 285 feet northerly from Elm Street to Crescent Street and add also, uh, Henshaw Avenue easterly, 1201 a.m. to 6 a.m., uh, point 285 feet northerly from Elm Street, point 72 feet, uh, uh, two point 72 feet southerly from Crescent Street. Move to approve. Second. Second. So we're combining these two. Uh, is there any discussion on these two issues, Councilor Freeman? Daniel? <coughs> when this was brought to the Transportation Parking Commission, we, uh, we de deferred. To the committee, the committee on disabilities, and uh, I also thank them for their um, due diligence here. Uh, may I ask a procedural question that just causes me some concern? In that, uh, and I'm not opining, so I and it's as well. I this seems to be the establishment of a handicap parking space for a specific couple of sorts. The, are there services nearby that can be used? By I think that's a very good question. As I as I started, I think that was the initial question. I think was raised both at the transportation parking, and by the committee of disabilities. And it is something that we looked at, which was, what if we start doing this for individual people? But in the, in discussions, we realized this is a very unique situation. the situation for the folks who are asking and the actual location of why they're asking for it. And. Uh, so I think you raise a good point. I think that point was taken as like we don't want to get in the practice of 
of doing this all the time. But I think if there were, I, I would certainly say if there were other cases like this, I think as a city that's flexible enough and a community that's flexible enough, we probably would approve it in the few cases very similar that would come forward. Uh, two things. First, um, if you wish to refer this to ha give it a longer process, that's certainly that's great. possible. But the other piece is that uh, one consideration I, uh, I know that the Transportation Parking Commission brought up was that uh, that um, how how densely parked up the street is. Uh, in other words, if, if the street's very densely parked, then there would be less of a um, likelihood to grant a, a handicap parking space for for particular individuals, but with the street l less parked, um, this is just this. All it really does is it's not taking away a, a very valuable asset. It's taking away an asset that that can be uh, designated. So I think that's part of the consideration and the part of the uniqueness that Councillor mm -hmm. Spector is talking about. Yeah, uh, my concern, and by the way, first of all, I should point out that uh, unique is a term that is absolute and cannot be modified. But I did not say very. But, and I'm actually trying to determine, I don't believe that we have a policy, relevant, you know, for something equivalent would be spot zoning and planning, but there's nothing like that that I understand, and I certainly understand the desire for this. It's in 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 transport. I'm I'm actually this is more for information purposes, so I, I'm not actually trying to dissuade or persuade anyone in one way or the other, Councillor Tacy. Yeah, I had, <clears throat> had asked my question. But this, this is a snapshot in time. This parking space that can be eliminated when the need is not there, or is this <clears throat> um, because I have no problem accommodating. Uh, whether the disability is, is that they are elderly or, or handicapped doesn't make any difference to me one way or another. But is this a handicapped parking space that could go away if it was no longer needed there? Yes. That was my, that's my question. And this is an interesting discussion about whether you, you do these kind of things when somebody requests it as a long serving counselor here in a, in a, in a ward where parking is up there with kind of drone strikes in Ward 2, you know, that we're, we're interested in international affairs and parking. Parking is probably the biggest thing I get calls about in my ward. This is the first time in ten, almost 10 years I've ever had a request to something like this. And I asked other counselors, it has been extremely rare. And I'm not worried about opening some floodgate right. here. And again, I want to still think of us as a small community that can be accommodating if somebody calls and that we can deal with these things when they are just idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic. I, I, to Very the idiosyncratic. Here, here. And, <laughs> you know, and good on us and the fact that we've devoted more conversation to one particular parking incident than we have to the city budget, of course, is clearly points out how important this is to all of us. I, it, the, uh, but the only caveat, and it won't affect my vote here again, is the only caveat is we, this is how historically we once put in stop signs. That they remain as artifacts that don't have any useful function. And this is Councillor Tacey's point that it, this is not a permanently embedded yeah. parking space and that has and can be rescinded when the need no longer is a, a there. Councillor Freeman Daniels. Uh, well, I, I mean, it, it's ordinance, so it can be changed. Right. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, like I said, it, you're willing, if, you're, if you wish to, I'm sure the Transportation Park Commission would right. consider it. But uh, I think that um, given that this is having, this is, having to do with winter, the winter months. And I, I think the other key element here is that the, there is not a dramatic, there's not a lot of competition for parking right. in that particular area. And so because there isn't much competition, it's, it's okay to, uh, to, to designate. Uh, I, think, I think that's uh, a key I, uh, matter. No, I, I have no intention of delaying this uh, from proceeding. And um, uh, it, it, it's just I, f I felt it needed to be considered and addressed or at least discussed on this floor. Councilor LaBarge. Yes, um, and I also think we need to understand here, and I did repeat myself on this before, this and then this elderly couple, they do realize that that parking space is just not for them. It's for anybody who's handicapped. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 A
opposed? Abstentions? Okay. They're both. They were both moved, and they were both. We both voted on both of those. Just yep. <coughs> so we're clear on that. Okay. Moving along. <laughs> How long after the meeting we'll be signing these papers? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Enrollment committee will be long committed here. Uh, this is an ordinance of the City of Northampton providing the Code of Ordinances uh, for the City of Northampton be amended by revising Section 350-10.5, and it's hard to make out here, 350-10.6 three, uh, and 350, uh, it's sequence, I think I can't see 350A, it's a, it's a, I think it's a chart. You. Thank you, thank you. Uh, providing that and then delete uh, uh, planned unit development amend open space residential development to incorporate previously allowed as PUDs. To be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City assembled as follows. Um, and then, okay. Open space or cluster residential development are allowed use as common buildings, including uh, shared mail facilities, recreation, uh, dining, laundry, guest rooms, personal office space and shared and maintenance facilities, and retail and or personal services not to exceed the lesser of 2% of the total gross floor area of the cluster or 4,000 square feet may be allowed in a cluster but are limited to common facilities which primarily serve residents of the cluster but generally not outside paying guests, and childcare facilities for residents and outside customers. Setbacks on the common buildings must be equal setbacks required for non-clustered houses in the subdivision. Uh, common buildings are not considered dwelling units, nor can they be credited to open space requirements and the dimensional, the dimensional requirements of 350A. Uh, tables of dimensional and density regulation shall apply to common buildings. Um, so, oh, is that, is that just correcting a typo? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, the 350-106. Uh, Plan to unit development, delete the entire section, and the reason being this section heavily overlaps with uh, 10.5 open space residential development and the zoning will be simplified by bringing the extra opportunity for the PUD into open space residential development. And then 350A through end of 350 appendixes, uh, table use of regulations, uh, table of dimensional and density regulations, use in dimensional regulations, delete all references to planned unit development PUDs, where the table entries are combined with open space, uh, residential development, cluster, or cluster residential development, only delete <laughs> land unit development and PUD. Where entries are not combined, delete entire table, and the reason being these entries are unnecessary if PUD uses are allowed as part of open space residential development. Second. Second. And discussion. Uh, let's see, I'll, we'll do uh, Councilor Tacey, Freeman Daniels, then Adams. So. It, it's funny how um, this is all about, like, cluster, because it, it gets clustered, the zoning gets clustered over a period of time, and it's been passed and repassed, and then it gets amended, and then we keep taking pieces out. And this is what history has shown us throughout our zoning and our permitting process, that these things need to change. And um, I'm, I gave this a lot of thought, and spoke with Wayne and Carolyn on this, and I intend to support this. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor. I, I, uh, I'd like to move to recognize uh, planning director. Oh, he's still here. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Wayne. I didn't even know you were still here. I, I, okay, the planning director, Wayne Fiden, has been uh, the motion to recognize him made. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, uh, take it away, Wayne. So, um, PUDs, we haven't had a PUD in the city in 30 years. The last one, the last one and the only one we've ever had was Fairway Village. Um, and so we just we have the section of zoning ordinance that people read and confuses them and basically the suggestion is let's just get rid of it because no one's using it. There's a few good ideas in the PUD. Let's bring that over to cluster. And the ideas are, you know, we often talk about how do you get people not to have to drive everywhere. So are there a few things that can come into a cluster, into a, in a, to a residential neighborhood, which might avoid people needing to drive there? Um, and so that's things like child care. Um, and not a lot of retail, but this is the maximum of the 2% of the square footage is retail. So just, you know, so those kinds of things expand that use a little bit. We last did a similar expansion 
maybe 15 years ago, 12 years ago, when we allowed co-housing projects. Before co-housing, all you could do in a cluster was housing period. And then co-housing, we said, well, these, these, the single building, the building's small. It's not a commercial center, but it works. We're just trying to give a little more flexibility for that building. If you took one of those buildings today and literally put up a newspaper stand, it's probably technically in violation. That sort of small retail could be great. Council. Uh, thank you, um, Director Fiden, for that summary. Uh, my understanding is that this, that the open space or the cluster development would be slightly more restrictive as far as commercial uses than the uh, PUD, but no one really uses the PUD. That's exactly that right. Kind of a summary, a, good, a decent summary? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Council. And all of this could be done by superseded or whatever by a special permit, maybe? Um, we don't, there's, there's, for the I mean, most part. It, it came to that point where something was really important. It can't do, it, you couldn't make it larger than 4,000 square feet. Okay. So we don't have a provision for doing that. Um, we do have something else called 40R, so potentially there's other zoning districts that we might do if we're trying to get more of a mixed use piece up there. And that would be my question, the mixed use part. Yeah. Okay. And could you tell, I'm sorry. Uh, could you say, <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you say where where these cluster, where have we had these cluster res developments, I mean, historically? Yeah, um, except for Northampton State Hospital, which is a different kind of beast, every single subdivision we've had in the last 19 years has been clusters. Um, so we, even though in theory we allowed traditional subdivisions, nobody's taken us up on that in a say in about 19 years. And, and why is that? Um, the zoning space, well, two answers, I think. One is the zoning was deliberately written to encourage that, so you get a few more units for cluster, and particularly roads cost about $300 a foot. You need less roads. The other thing is <clears throat> most developers want a clear path to being approved, and the planning board's been pretty clear they prefer clusters. So if you're a developer and are trying to figure out which route do you do, you do the one that's easier to get approved. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, clusters. I, I believe the first one was uh, Ryan Road, um, the Matthew Drive. It is exactly right. not clear cutting everything, and you had a lot of trees, you had open space around it. It was all part of the permitting process. And uh, it seems to have worked out, as far as I can see, pretty well. Smaller lots, much less road, easier development. We, we require 50% of a cluster to be open space. And given the way the formula works with wetlands, it really turns out to be at 60% as open space. Yep. And the market seems to support the smaller lots, um, so there's not that kind of resistance there anyway. Especially in today's market. Any other questions of uh, Wayne? No? Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. God, Wayne's still here. That's upon the recommendation of the Planning Board. Uh, this is an ordinance, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, to be amended by revising Section 350-3.4 of said code, providing that, that rezone densely developed residential properties between Barrett Street and Bridge Road from URB to URC to reflect current uses, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled. Thank goodness we've established where the city council is. As follows, that the section 350, <laughs> oh, I forget it. Oh, you should know. I, uh, it's good. But we, we uh, can I, can I waive reading? Yeah. Hmm? Can I waive reading? Consider it done. Uh, <laughs> Wayne, do you want to step up and uh, give an explanation here? This is part of, you're, you're going to see a series of these things. We're basically trying to clean up some weird things in the zoning. If you remember, we came before you about three months ago for River Run Apartments. It was a similar thing. River Run has been housing for 25 years. The zone didn't reflect it. This is the same thing. Hampshire Heights and what's now called Hathaway Farms, it used to be called Hampton Gardens, um, are dense multifamily housing projects. Mm -hmm. URB does not allow dense multifamily housing projects. So, and they're actually even denser than URC allows. 
but at least we're coming closer. Because right now you can imagine, in theory, what the zoning says is if there's a fire at Hampshire Heights, they shouldn't rebuild. That's not what we want there. We want one and two family homes. And I don't think that's anyone's intention. So this basically just grandfather, you know, basically formalizes them being there. Um, it doesn't have a huge effect. It has some minor effects, as I say, if there's a fire and a building burns down. It's easier for them to replace it. Um, it's not at, as out of conformance to the zoning. Uh, and it's sort of a truth in advertising. It's, we're only doing those two properties, so it doesn't. it's not adding density to that area. So these will still, even with this change, there will be some pre-existing non-conforming uses then? Uh, absolutely yes for uh, Hampshire Heights, which is denser. Um, Hamden Gardens is closer, so I have to look at that, the map to, to figure exactly where they are. But I believe it's also true for Hampton Gardens. Uh, any questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Sanctions? Thank you all. Here we go. We're up to the referrals. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the Planning Board, and um, this is uh, 358 through the end of 350 appendices to the table use of regulations. On the table of dimensional density and regulations, dimensional regulations. I will accept. Move to refer out. <coughs> Can we Second. clarify that motion? Yes, uh, the the motion is to refer to Edlu and to ordinance. Yes. And planning. 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 And planning. Economic Edlu ordinance and elections. Ordinance. All right. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor for referring? Aye. 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 This is also upon the recommendation of uh, the Planning Board, and this is related to the zoning map. Um, there's a motion to refer to... Planning Board. Edlu. Ed planning Board, Edlu. And ordinance. And ordinance. And ordinance. And ordinance. And ordinance. You want to tack anything else on? No. Nope. All right. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Aye. All those in favor of referring? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. That's upon the recommendation of the Historical Commission, the Historic District Commission, is, uh, to refer as well. Uh, this is essentially combining the two existing historic commissions that stand now into Which one. Second. Yeah. And Councilor Freeman. Uh, so that's moved and second to move to ordinance. Councilor Freeman Daniels? I'd like to. Uh, postpone this to next meeting. There's a motion to postpone. Second. It's, it's being referred. Do you want to postpone the referral? Uh, okay. The, well, the motion's been made to postpone, and and do you want to expand on that? Yeah. Um, this seems. Excuse me. <laughs> is there a second on the? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there was, Jesse. This order, this ordinance change, seems to me to be. Um, similar to the previous discussion we had about uh, uh, inter uh, in legislative interference with the effective uh, administration of government as by our new charter. Uh, I do not believe that uh, the, we can introduce this ordinance change, that it has to be done through administrative order from the mayor. And I understand that the city solicitor would will probably be making some determination on that for the next meeting regarding a separate ordinance um, and so I would like I would like to ask the, the councils uh, to the council to wait until the next meeting because I think that this is in uh, this or this ordinance is not permissible under our current charter I, uh, I had, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I had a, um, a similar well I, there, there's a similar issue that I've experienced I drafted an ordinance to make a long story short. Um, I'm trying to create an ordinance that would make a rule that applies to all commissions, boards, elect and, and um, multiple member bodies. And the solicitor asked me to um, give him some more time to, to just clarify whether or not we can do that. And I think similarly, this is an issue that falls under, under Councilor Freeman Daniels' point about what is subject to administrative order versus what can be done by ordinance. So I, I support the motion to postpone. I think that the solicitor is going to um, give his 
opinion and maybe some clarification on on this gray area which has come about because of the new charter passage and would it be your pleasure to actually ask the solicitor in in, in writing or that to send forward a request to review this well, yeah. ordinance, uh, and and with a recommendation as to clarity and division of powers I yeah. think so I, I just yes <laughs> I think he's going to answer my question which I think is the same question so I think the answer is coming okay oh so, so we're waiting we're, you're waiting for right and he, and he said he'll have it in time for me to if it's legitimate to submit it by the next council meeting okay council table. given the lack of urgency yeah postpone it Wayne is there a lack of urgency yeah no. okay all right so uh, any other discussion on the motion to postpone all those in favor of postponing aye aye opposed abstentions oh. <coughs> to to the next meeting to the next meeting i'm sorry yes to the ne next meeting uh depending on the solicitor's memo hopefully or the solicitor's opinion <clears throat> upon the recommendation of the planning board this is an ordinance uh be ordained the city council of the city of northampton uh that section 357.7 7 of the code of ordinances of the city of northampton massachusetts be amended so that such section shall read as follows all non-conforming non-accessory signs in existence and lawfully erected before the adoption of this chapter may continue to be maintained notwithstanding anything to the contrary existing sign structures may not be replaced once a sign falls into disrepair or requires reframing to meet safety standards it must be eliminated um, is there a motion to refer? Yeah, re refer it to ordinance. Second. Yeah. When do you have to Trust me, planning board, and if at your pleasure, Ed. Uh, motion to uh, yes. send it off. So those, okay, so Ed Lou planning board and ordinance, that the motion is made. All those in favor of? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you. This is also uh, from the recommendation of the planning board. We're getting there. We're almost there. Um, this is uh, this is to amend the zoning maps. Um, these, I would entertain a motion to refer. Move to refer. Can we add Ed Lou to that? Ed, Ed, Ed Lou, <coughs> so we're referring it to Ed Lou. An ordinance. ordinance. It came from the planning board. Right. That's right. Zoning ordinances have to the planning board, even when it came from them. Oh, really? The planning board too, then. All right. <laughs> well, let's be consistent. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. You don't want to stay? <laughs> almost done. <laughs> We're almost done. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of uh, Mayor David J. Narkowitz and Council Marianne Labarge, and this is. Uh, to be referred uh, this is relative to the establishment of the committee on disabilities uh, to refer any language second motion to refer to second I move to postpone this to the next meeting for the same reason second yeah, I think this may have to be done by administrative order but I just want clarification on it. okay so for the same reason that we postponed the other one the, the recommendation is to postpone this on review of the city solicitor is there any discussion about that? Councilor Labarge? Yes. Um, I think this was scheduled on the agenda for Ordinance Committee on February 7th. Is that correct? I mean, February 11th, Mary? If it was referred. Yeah. If it's not referred, it's not. It's oh, not because it is on their agenda. We'll just right. make the Ordinance Committee that much shorter. <laughs> Show up. It does I, delay like this to, by a month, of course. I'd like to question Councillor Owen Freeman Daniels. What is the problem with this? May I, Chair, Mr. Chair, may I respond? Okay, I'm going to respond. <laughs> I'm going to respond out of order. Uh, again, um, the reading that's the reading of the charter uh, that uh, the solicitor is 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 seems as though the solicitor is exercising. Uh, is that um, any committee that is not a committee of the school committee or the city council or a 
mayoral advisory committee. HAT is a committee that deals with the effective administration of government. And the administration of government can, uh, is, um, is immune to council amendment, to legislative amendment. Um, the way that it seems that uh, the administration of government needs to occur is to be introduced solely by the mayor through administrative order, not through ordinance. Uh, and this is a char This is a, an element of the charter that, um, in many ways, uh, is uh, just a, around separation of powers. And, and really, we they, it wasn't openly debated uh, prior to its uh, to the council approving it, um, because in in many ways it it is an it is an effective separation of powers. But uh, what I think the council has been used to doing, which is uh, legislating the the organization of committees and multiple member bodies in the city, I, I do not believe the council can do anymore. Uh, so, but we're going to hear from the from the solicitors shortly regarding that, and and I think that uh, uh, we should wait before we uh, refer anything that is uh, against the city's charter. Uh, Council Labarge, you were okay. asking questions. My question is knowing for a fact that the mayor and the city solicitor worked very, very closely on this language together. Because I know both Pat Shaughnessy and I were in the mayor's office working with the language with the mayor and with the city solicitor. <coughs> yeah, I, I think the solicitor, uh, I, I'm not sure if this, <coughs> What I can what I can tell you is that the issue that the solicitor ha has uh, um, has related uh, to to Councillor Adams and to myself, we're, we're both trying to work on this ordinance, um, is a relatively new issue. So it, it might have been that the solicitor did not uh, realize the depth of this of this uh, divide in uh, in the effective administration of government that we're now pushing up against. Councillor Adams. Also, Councilor Labarge, um, it's we're just looking for the solic for sol clarification from the solicitor, um, and certainly the ordinance is a good idea, and we just want to make sure that in, in it, that that it doesn't need some sort of change of form because if worst case scenario, the same um, concept could be embodied in, in a correct form if if that needs to take place. Also, I um, I I think it's it's Charter Section six point one that that the, the language from that section is what um, is is what we're talking about here. I'm happy to discuss that further with you at some yeah, point. Can I can I just point out the reason why we seem to be on the same page is we discussed this earlier in relation to a, to another ordinance that we're trying to craft and, yeah. and uh, um, it seems as it, I think that Council Adams has the right point. Everything listed here probably sh just should be rewritten in a, into an administrative order and sponsored by the mayor. And I think I think that would win the unanimous or or the majority support from the council but as an ordinance i do not believe that it can be it can go forward the, 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 I'm sorry. for points of clarification the concern is who has the in the under the new charter who has the authority to determine this and to appoint this and uh i think the question is new and it's one that comes from the new definitions as they're solicitor understands them on the charter and we we anticipated that we we're going to bump up against something and this is part of the shakeout um, it's unfortunate because it delays it by a month but I think that you can feel confident that that at least based by the temperature I'm able to take here that the council seems to be in accord with this and would probably approve it it's just we have to determine is is this something that we Authorize, or is this something that, by our request, or is this something that the mayor authorizes? That we authorize, <laughs> we approve the mayor's authorization, and and so that's. In order for it to function validly, there is a possibility that this is flawed, and then that would put this committee in jeopardy, uh, and we might have to do it all over again. And, and what I think these two gentlemen are requesting, and I, I don't disagree with it. I think. Um, Let's cross the T's and dots, dot the I's, and then we'll, the charge will be on us to proceed to try and find out and suss out these other potential just wrinkles in the rut. That's it. And, and, and I think that's all it is. It's not, I don't think you're meeting with resistance to the, 
to the the spirit of this by any means. Um, it, so the motion is to postpone um, for the reasons cited. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Well, you're going to find this hard to believe. We actually run up to the end of the meeting, which is damn good because we're almost about in violation of our rules. But uh, there's, uh, I have no further updates. Me, is there any new business? Uh, just, just one quick update, a reminder to counselors that ordinance on Monday, I think we may be taking our last crack at rules changes before they come back to the council. So if any of you want to join us, ordinance on Monday, it appears it's a relatively quick agenda, so we'd get to this. And I think from our last working session, we're just about done. So. I think so. so Thank you. Check them out before they come back. Monday. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all very much. Thank you.